Hi, hello, everybody. This is James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation. This is the first time I've ever gone live. There is David, formerly known as Griffin. He's in the background there, and um, he is just napping out there. So uh, I'm just testing this out, seeing how it goes with live. I'm really not um, sure of the quality of, uh, of the connection because um, I'm on my Wi-Fi at the back of the uh, my place here, so it's a little bit spotty sometimes. Anyhow. If you have um, any questions about anything that are going on, feel free to type it in to the chat, uh, the live chat, and I'll try to respond. Uh, I'm going to go over a few things today in my first live in 2021 and actually my first live in over a year and a half. And uh, what I'll be doing is I'll be describing um, uh, behaviors that are happening with my dogs at all times. So if something shifts, at the, right, right now there's David and Sammy is, oh, Sammy's right here behind me. Sammy and David. So uh, if the other dogs come into the room, obviously I won't be able to maintain the conversation and I will be working with them if there are any issues that arise live while we're working. And so you'll get a concept of what's going on and then you'll be able to understand what I see in the process of dogs at about 10th of a second is what they're processing. I'm seeing it a few minutes, a few, like two tenths of a second later. Uh, we can all learn how to do that. I'll be talking about also, I'm just going to do a blind react review to the Smithsonian article that I put the link in there. Uh, Tony sent it to me, and I'll explain who Tony is. And he sent it to me uh, regards to uh, you know our project, but also it, the, the article is about whether or not dogs are self-aware. So I didn't read it. I just kind of glanced through it really quickly because a lot of times the stuff that I see uh, is kind of boring. So I'll go through that, and then that should be about it. So. Um, for an update, and, and thank you, if, uh, Julie, um, if you're uh, if you're here yet, because I know you're trying to figure out how to do it. Um, okay, so for an update for 2021, what has been happening is that uh, back in the summertime, with actually with Griffin slash David here, you see I have two beds here for them all, right? Because I have three Great Danes, a Formosan Mountain Dog, and a um, a, which, uh, ugh, a, a Jindo Minky. So. Um, so back when uh, issues were happening with, with David slash Griffin. So I'll call him Griffin and then I'll transition him to the name David. So with Griffin, he was having a, a lot of difficulties. He was two and a half years of age. And I'll just switch it over here a little bit more to him so you can see. And I have you. Okay, so there he is. So he's two and a half years old. From the age of six months, uh, Griffin um, was basically... Uh, a difficult dog to deal with. He's almost 200 pounds. He's 38 inches at the widow. So that's three feet tall, just at the shoulders and then his head. So he's a rather significant dog. I work with dogs at this level because it's just, I think that they deserve a chance. And these are dogs, again, that have attempted to kill people. It's not, a, it's not me just saying that these are literally dogs and they're giant dogs. So you can check out the media links in the newspaper about what I do, it's verified. Uh, so David, I'm sorry, because I call him David, Griffin was on 750 milligrams of trazodone a day since the age of six months for two years. A person in a hospital as a patient would be getting 600 milligrams as a suggested dosage for um, uh, as well. They were giving him Prozac 80 milligrams and a patient in the hospital would be given 60 milligrams. So here's a difference, though, as well. When they're on that much medication, <clears throat> excuse me it can create serotonin syndrome. And more than likely after two years, it's gonna cause that, which one of the side effects are, as I Googled it, right? So Google it, uh, is also aggression. So what he, what they were trying to deal with wasn't being dealt with, which was basically he wasn't listening. He was becoming aggressive. David himself also has coincidentally 16 bites on him as well. So he has bitten people, lunged at people, dragged uh, his, his humans because he's, close to 200 pounds, he was about 170, 180 when he arrived and I feed raw. So anyhow, so he's quite a, a strong, powerful dog. And to, to address the things with David meant to address his psychological processing. And for a dog to have such severe extreme issues means that they have a certain cogency level, a certain level of intelligence to be able to survive, to be able to provide a charismatic connection between the human being in a psychological manner, the aspects of endearment, etc. It's essentially when you meet somebody and you kind of like them or not. This is the same thing when it happens with dogs. He just happened to have, by coincidence and pure luck, 
the type of personality that people who were in rescue and his fosters and adopters were willing to go, you know what? I know he bit and attacked me, but he doesn't deserve to die. It's a hard line to, to, to differentiate because some people will say, well, you know what? Dogs attack people. They're dangerous and they can't be helped. A giant dog like David can't be, you know, trusted, et cetera. And you see the videos that I have been posting, a couple of them, where David is downtown. He's walking around. People are taking pictures with him and they're trying to pet him and all that stuff. And I just don't like people touching uh, my dog because, you know, you never know where their hands have been and stuff like that. And I've seen those Seinfeld videos. So um, anyhow, so he's a, an extremely vicious dog. He had to be muzzled. He was actually driven up here by Bobby Joe Becker, the founder of Tales of Freedom Canine Rescue in uh, Indiana. And she drove him up herself personally. He was muzzled the whole time. He was very vicious. He would go after when she went into the cities to fuel up. He would go after people walking by cars and even trucks going by. Aside from cars, he would do that as well. Extreme, extreme uh, issues in regards to resources, etc. So by bringing him in here, work him and stabilize him and get David into a real uh, clean focus of what and who he really is to be able to think clearly. And that's the difference as well, is that he did not need the medication, but the trainers didn't know what to do. And that one trainer that I was saying is a, a well-known uh, canine police dog trainer with big fancy four by four trucks who essentially tried to alpha and oppress and create a uh, Stockholm Syndrome type of relationship by making David put into not just a submissive position where he's subjugated to things that were terrorizing him, other dogs, other people, all that kind of stuff, but also, also caused him to be really suppressed in his ability to function and to learn from things that were happening. So as you guys see, he's here. There's no issues with him. Um, he has some conflicts with the other dogs here in the beginning. Obviously, it's quite, quite significant attacks on each other. Those kinds of things happen, and you deal with it. And when dealing with Great Danes, when they fight, they move furniture, and their their bites are, are quite vicious. As um, I've got some stuff going on here, like in, in scars and everything. So, well, you probably can't see. It. I'm so pale. Okay, so that's David, and then I have William, who's from Mexico. He'll be coming up, all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to answer questions. So I get a lot of trolls. I, I get an immensely uh, uh, um, irritating amount of trolls and they always go on ah, and they make all these little jokes and they think that I don't know what I'm talking about. I work with the most extremely dangerous dogs. I'll do it. I've never turned down any dog. So I say to everybody, you don't believe me, send me a dog. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. My, my uh, email is james at rfarfbarkbark.com. My rescue page is non, uh, I'm a registered nonprofit, rfarfbarkbark.com. Send a dog down here. Send the most extremely dangerous dog that you can find. Send them down here and I will work with them, right? We will set up a contract situation on that part. I don't charge a lot of money. Bring them down there. If you're a trainer of behaviors who thinks that I'm just talking and I don't know what I'm talking about, then you've got to really understand and comprehend the way that dogs process. Because they're processing at an extremely fast, quick function of time. And I'm talking in a different tone of voice as I would when I would normally be talking to them. So then they're not picking up the context of what I'm saying in the conversation as well. Hi, David. Hi, silly boy. Hi, Sammy. Then I make the acknowledgement if I'm going to refer to my dogs by name as well. And it's important to say your dog's name because then it gives them the individual the individualization, it gives them the pronouncing of who they are in regards to establishing self of ego. So if your dog has an understanding of who they are, self sense of ego, who they are in that regards of scientists are saying, well, dogs are like children, two to three year old children. What they're needing to um, understand and comprehend is that dogs are processing in a rudimentary format that the development of that processing is similar to that of a child, a human child, of course, but the dog's brain doesn't have the same structure, obviously, to be as sophisticated as the humans. And on top of that, the limitation of how the dog perceives things in that childlike developmental manner is going to be on a diluted scale comparative to how humans see things. So when we're looking at that part of how fast the dog is processing with childlike qualities, in other words, when they process things that are happening, they're happening in absolutes. When we think we have the, the we have the leisure to think about, oh, well, maybe I should do this. We have considerations, deliberations, doubts. With dogs, they think in absolutes 
innately because that's a predacious nature. But when they actually behave and they do things around, it's constructive behavior, right? It's consciousness, aspects of sentience. So they're putting things to regret together. When they get upset, then they go down to what I call emergency power of emotions, where they just work on core behaviors. Just like anybody you know getting angry, you just start working on core powers, core behaviors of what you always do. How do you react to something? Oh, it always reacts that way to something like that. That is a trigger. Like, you know, you're upset, flat tire. You react the same way as if you're, you know. Anyways, I don't want to describe the little things because, you know, sorry. Um, so with all these core behaviors, what the dog is doing. Hi, Judy. Uh, all these core behaviors, what the dog is doing is, a, is an extremely important part to understand the construct of what the dog is doing. So here's the thing. People go, well, the dog just did something suddenly unpredictable, attack the other dog, started defecating for no reason. These are all psychological things that are happening. If a dog attacks another dog and we say, oh, that was suddenly what happened, it's not actually suddenly what happened. What it is, is that all the signs were there, they were happening at a tenth of a second, and they were boiling over and over and over. And if you're coming from a definitely difficult life, predacious lifestyle, as dogs do to protect yourself, self-defense. The first thing you're gonna think of, this is an issue with someone I don't like across from me and they're this far away, I better get ready to attack the minute I see them enter the room. So the dysfunction starts to happen where the dog's psychology goes, okay, uh, I'm gonna get attacked, I don't know what to do, all right, I don't know what to do, and then they start stripping away all the emotional context to think logically and self-soothe to get down to the core aspects of primal behavior, which is fight or flight. And if you're stuck in your home, you've got nowhere you can go. So that's what's going to end up happening is they're going to start behaving suddenly, unpredictably, when in actual fact, it's been boiling over. Just like being in a relationship with somebody. And I'm going to do all human analogies so it makes it easier for people to understand. And I've worked with CEOs of multinationals. Everybody makes sense when it's a human analogy for them. So I won't get into the psychology of things or the endothermic structure of things that I also think. But it comes to the point that all our behaviors are, are built up on little things. Evolution, right? How do we learn how to talk? I'm literally doing millions of years of evolution every single time I talk. But all that comes from a frame of behavior, a timeline of evolution, right? And we shrink it all down. Oh, look at I'm talking, but it, it took millions of years. Dog's behavior that we see suddenly was bridged out a lot longer than that. And yes, dogs are reacting much quicker when that happens, we've got to figure out the little slivers of that behavior, the nuances of the anger, the nuances of the dysfunctions, then we get the idea of why the dog is upset. And when they get upset, we go, okay, now what do we check for the physical manifestations of what the dog's body is doing and how they behave? So the paw position, the body structure, the breathing pattern, how the dog is holding themselves, hackles, whether or not it's half hackles, full hackles, peel erection, right? Call I call it full mohawk. Uh, it is the aspect of what the dog's behavior is physiologically that also reflects what's going on. And people go, well, the, the tongue, a dog's licking it, it doesn't mean anything. It actually is resident in cognitive processing. Just like when you see a little kid doing homework, they go, what do they do? All right, they stick their tongue out. Mm, mm. They do all these things that are manifesting their inability to figure out. They got to concentrate. So they do a distraction. When it comes to the dog's behaving, such as tongue aspect, which is an analysis behavior, then the dog's got to process what's going on and they get streamlined. And so it's manifested physically in what the dog is doing. So the tongue behavior, eye pattern, blinking pattern, even when they raise the right eyebrow in regards to a, a, it's an affirmation behavior to the left eyebrow, how the dog process time in an abstract format. All these things have relevance in the dog's behavior. They are how the dog processes in a rudimentary format, a diluted perspective. So if I can say that two plus two equals four at a cognitive level of 100% as, you know, 100 out of 100 for a dog, which I deem in maybe the 70, 80 percentile aspect of uh, ability to create cognition, when they hear two plus two equals four, and we're talking abstract points of it, then the dog is actually understanding an ideation, an idea a process. So when you see things like, uh, what, what about bunny and all these other things about teaching the dog, press the button and the dog learns how to talk and all that stuff. If you actually look at it, this is what David Letterman had on his TV show when he was on 
caught stupid human tricks and stupid pet tricks. Those, what about bunny ones where she's got 5 million viewers and I, and I contacted her and said, what she's doing is incorrect. She actually blocked me and then realized who I was and unblocked me. And I got screenshots. It's literally a performative set of behaviors. That's all it is. And then when you listen to the human talk to Bunny and other dogs and that thing, you know, it's been on CNN and all stuff, listen to the way the humans are creating timing sequences and inflection points so quickly that they can't tell. They're actually picking up their dog's cues and leading their dog forward. So it's performative. But everyone goes, oh, my gosh, the dog has learned how to tell you what to do. And I say that's garbage. You want to teach your dog truly how to be cognitively processed. And I think this, uh, there's a, a website, a newspaper article, let's talk about animals or whatever it is. I, I, I don't care. You guys can email. You want to create a performative aspect? No. You want a dog to be cogent, to be able to construct things together. So how do you create a dog that has cogency? What, what are they doing wrong? Everything. They're doing performative. It's a circus act that's complex looking. So I said to her, the, why she blocked me, I guess, is I said, have the buttons situated so that you can press them, the dog can press them, not color coded, because then you're just creating further aspect of, I'm leading the dog to say what I want them to say, and then put it up on YouTube and look famous. If it's all coded the same, the same colors, how's the dog gonna figure out? Well, then the dog starts from the basic aspect of comprehension, consciousness of learning. The dog creates a construct. One word, two words, etc. You have seen my videos of the people out there, my followers. I taught Anthony, who's with Tony. I'll talk about Tony in a bit. I taught Anthony the concept of slow down. And you can see that on my TikTok. He actually slows down, contextually processes what's going on. I taught Anthony the objectification of the phrase can of tuna on my TikTok, Instagram, etc. You can see him processing the words. And it took me about 20 to 30 minutes to do so because of the establishment of, the, uh, of our communication. You can see where he is looking at it, has doubt, has cognition, that cogency similar to a primate. So you see the aspects of construct that's going on. So for Bunny, what about Bunny, whatever her name is, make all the buttons the same or have some slight gradient shift, all the same colors. So there's still context and it causes a different cognition in the brain. People who hire me, they say, hey, you know what? what what's my dog like? And I'll tell them, level of dogs intelligence and i'll tell them to go look on youtube for videos of uh thinking games for dogs and then people go okay that's kind of cool uh what kind i'm like well look for two to three year old games cognitive games for children and then adapt them to your own so situations like that because you got to use your intelligence you if you if you think the dog is dumb but i'm going to teach it how to talk then you, then you have the comedy show that's going on in these Scientists saying ling linguists and all that stuff in Seattle doing this thing about all of this stuff. Doesn't do anything. The colors are always the same. You can change the recordings because each button you can record. Doesn't do anything. Silly. It's a stupid pet trick. Same color or gradient of colors. Put it in the position so the dog understands construct. In other words, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. That's how we humans learn how to talk. But apparently the dog is stupid and dumb. So we got to do color coding and electronic voices. Another thing I suggested to her in a polite way, and, and, and of course, I'm always polite, is even though I'm kind of you know emotional here, I'm not though, uh, I'm just so enthused. And another aspect is remove all the electronic voices of your self-recorded voice. You can put, why would you give your dog the buttons to press that has your voice on it? The dog no longer has an identification of self. There's no ego-driven behavior, it's gone. There's no ego supporting behavior because now you're hearing my, my human's voice. So now I'm speaking for my human. <laughs> it's a stupid pet trick, but it shows the low level of academic uh, uh, excellence being pursued when things like that are being seen. And another aspect as well, and some of you are probably thinking about this, is hooking up each button to a main natural voice speaker. Then the voice is coming out of one central location then you don't create compartmentalization and physical distraction when it comes to constructing an aspect of sophisticated emotional processing that is currently beyond her dog's capability because she is not being trained or educated correctly. So you see that, that this is the stuff that is just like makes perfect sense, but people aren't thinking about it. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna. I have to just step out here uh, real bit. You can check out these two. I got it. I'll be right back. Sorry, guys. And then I'll I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'll tell you what I'm doing, and then I'll go and read that article. Sorry. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to let you know. Uh, thanks for waiting, everyone. I'm going to let you know what I've been doing. And so I haven't been on social media for, for like five months now. And so what ended up happening, getting back to the story, is that when Griffin came up here, um, Bobby Joe uh, had some contacts. And uh, Anthony, who was here, um, that I was brought to me from L.A. overnight, um, he was then sent down as a animal transfer, rescue to rescue transfer. So I took Griffin in and then Bobby Joe took Anthony and they already had an adopter for Anthony. And I worked with Anthony's issues. And that's why when you watch the videos of Anthony, you see the level of intelligence he has, cogency. And everyone that meets any of the dogs that I've worked with and have stabilized, they're like, wow, your dog's so like paying attention and, and what? And I'm like, no, it's not anything special as per se, but it's an achievable ability for you to be able to do it with your own dogs. And so that's that structure that I'm I'm working with when it comes to all these other pups and everything. Um, so uh, Anthony went down there, uh, and and the family that adopted him, uh, the father, his name is Tony, which is really kind of cool because Tony and Anthony, and it was like almost meant to be. And um, it was funny because Tony had said, "Well, I, maybe I should change his name." I was thinking about it, and I went, "No, it's just it's a nice name, right? It's it's a good name, and it's a regular." Uh, it's a strong name. Anyways, so um, uh, aside from that, Bobby Joe said, you know what? Um, Tony wants to to meet you, and I think you should meet him, like by video or by phone and talk and figure out things, what are going on. And so I was like, okay, sure. Um, now, now, people who've known and followed me for, for six years know that I've had a lot of opportunities for people. Uh, well, not a lot, a couple of opportunities, should I say. Every once in a while, one or two times a year, I'll have somebody. Uh, who has uh, um, uh, who will say you know uh, uh, they have connections or in the industries or whatever I'll, I'll, I'll get you you know I can help you get a TV show etc and stuff like that and then it comes to the end of the days it's a personality conflict or or we just don't see eye to eye or it just was never meant to be and so that's happened quite often and it's usually it's both sides not just me it's them it's us it's not you it's me and um, so anyhow um. I'm really excited about the fact is that when I started talking to Tony, he says, you know, I love what you do, everything like that, and and all the stuff that you're doing. And, and the reason why I say all these things is that um, whenever someone says they're going to give me a hand, try to help me and promote my work, I'm always off the bat going, okay, whatever. Because I know what I do is worth a lot of money. And it's not about the money. Otherwise, I wouldn't be living, renting an old house like this on the, the main floor. Uh, and, I, and I've worked with somebody uh, before who um, is a, is a well-known social media person who's worked with Oprah Winfrey and Ryan Seacrest as well. Uh, Robert Mueller from SCOTUS, Supreme Court of Can uh, uh, United States, um, uh, people on an electric car company. Um, it's all great. And these are highly intelligent people, which is so awesome to talk to people who are smarter than me because it allows me to go, oh, I got to start looking in a dictionary more often. And what happened is um, I was talking to Tony and he says, I just love what you do. I, and I said, yeah, you know, I have the videos on the thing. He goes, I've already seen them. I've looked it. I've watched all your stuff and I really like what you do. I'm like, okay, awesome. You know, please love Anthony. Okay. Thank you so much. And I, and then he goes, I want to help your foundation. I want to help promote your work. I'm like, well, that's great. You know, I have PayPal, arf, arf, bark, bark. Um, you know, I'm pretty well self supporting. So it's a bit of a struggle once in a while. And I will 
and I and I'm like, okay, so what do you what do you think? He goes, well, you know, I I I'm work in software, essentially. And if I'm saying this wrong, Tony, I apologize. And he said, I'm working I work in software or or, or whatever. I write software or coding, and um, you know, I'd really like to help you out, you know, with your website and and maybe help you get an app. And I thought, okay, that would be very cool. But again, people have said that to me in the past. And but Anthony uh, with Tony, the way he was saying, he's like, okay, this guy seems like he's being, you know, straightforward. Hi, Margaret. Um, and so it seems like this guy's being straightforward. Because, you know, we, we hear people and every once in a while we hear the storyline. Like, okay, what do you want? How much money do I shell out? And stuff like that. And then it's like, okay, or else you're helping me, but you don't, we don't have the same vision. And and and, and I've dealt with that with somebody from a couple other TV uh, networks. And so it's kind of like, oh, it's not a worth about the money because if it gets perverted, the dogs suffer. There's six million being killed every year. I work with these dogs alone by myself, no treats or medication. I give them unmuzzled as soon as possible and integrate. And if there's a fight, I jump in physically. And I've always worried about being killed, not attacked and hurt, but being killed. Their heads are bigger than mine. And once that happens, uh, let me just call William, come please. He might be asleep. <clears throat> um, so it's all that aspect of, is it just somebody who understands what I'm talking about? Because when I process and, and deal with dogs, I'm looking at the compartmentalization of the dog's processes and the physiological structure, as well as the way the dog thinks. So that negotiation, you know, another dog coming into the room, as I said, then it's like, how do you deal with that? And why are these issues happening? Are there dependency issues? Are there uh, internal conflicts, interdependent uh, conflicts? Is there aspects of self-esteem issues that creates a conflict with another dog with self-esteem issues? I don't talk about fear or aggression. I talk about the root cause of behavior at the core and you'll see the level of that as you follow my live broadcast, this being the first one on YouTube. So when it comes to that point of um, of, of um, addressing, uh, what was that again? What did I, okay. Can somebody remind what I just said? I just heard a noise out there and I went, oh, is that it? All right, William, William, come please. Okay, he's not gonna come out, he's gonna sleep, all right. Um, so uh, with Tony, he said, I, I really want to help out what you're doing. I really love what you're doing. And, you know, I can help you more than just the website and 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 the app. And, uh, you know, the app we've been, he's been working on. I've been doing nothing, literally. I just started like, what is, what's, what's going on? What should I No, actually, I haven't. Uh, uh, but he's been working on that. He's going to get an app set up. And the app is going to be hopefully uh, quite a, a strong presence and influence, especially with connections uh, of getting it out on social media. Um, so Tony explained to me that he'd like to actually get my work promoted outward even more so into things that are more mainstream. And so I said, well, you know, it's really hard for my last six years when I started first time in 2014 by adopting my own great Dane. And then I was like, why is he so dangerous Lincoln? And then I figured out how to work with him. And through that time to the newspaper articles and media coverage, I was like, uh, right. And so uh, you know, n nothing's really happened. So, um, so he said, I want to get the stuff out into the mainstream. And I said, there's no way it's hard. I, I get trolled all the time. Right. I got a hundred thousand followers, almost a hundred thousand followers on TikTok, And you know, they, you know, I get the idiotic trainers and all that stuff trolling me because they don't know what I'm, I'm doing because they can't comprehend it. And it drives me nuts. Cause it's like, how come you're a professional, well-known trainer, but I have to teach you and, and you can't see it in the video, but you want me to teach you what I see. Because you're asking me questions while you're denigrating me. I'm like, how does that work again? You insult me, then ask me to explain what I'm doing? The process is very quick that's going on with dogs reacting at one-tenth of a second. Tony understands that because he programs, right? Instant gratification. We all live in that. Something gets done, does a program work, et cetera. So he's able to understand that process. What's unique about Tony is his ability to process that vision of what digital consciousness is about. So. Tony has a background in artificial intelligence. He's got a few things. He's got apps and all that stuff uh, out there, as well as, uh, uh, you know, first thing that Tony told me, because, again, I, I talked to, when we first started talking, I talked about the consciousness of dogs and how the process and how consciousness came to be in my theory of the biological compartmentalization of the false positive. And there's a lot of theory on that that I've shared with Tony. Um, so... He, he sent me an article, uh, uh, I guess a, a term, a worked paper or whatever he sends to his clients about his, because I'm not a corporate guy anymore. So he sends that information out 
to them about what his AI program does. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But before he told me about it, he said, you know, I've sold some software, proprietary software. I designed it and I sold it to Microsoft and I sold this to these people. I'm like, okay, I don't care about the who you know. I care about whether or not the person, the company buying it, if their product and their reputation is not, we're not talking about, if it's, there's quality, if there's a reason for it, is there an application within the industry? And, and of course, AI is a very important aspect. So then that comes back to the structure. Oh my gosh, how did human beings start to think? That's the, that problem size. So if you look at Templeton University, they have a silly program going on, a contest about trying to figure out consciousness, which is such an audacious behavior to do considering they haven't even figured out how to recognize consciousness in animals. If you can recognize consciousness in animals, then you can downtrain extremely dangerous dogs. Because then you know what psychologically is wrong with them. I'm going to have to get some water here. Then you know what psychologically is wrong with them, so you know how to fix them or heal them or stabilize them. So he said that... Um, we talked quite a bit and, he, and he, he said what he does and he said what he saw as a vision. And we talked about a few things and my, my, uh, uh, my post on, on, on my social media about going live, you know, he talked, we talked about Eve, that computer system, supercomputer um, that had to process information and became overloaded with memory and had to actually find an external source of memory, uh, which was to go out into the cloud to find it and then we and we I talked about what my perspective on that was and I'm not going to disclose it I talked about it that way just because it might get into some different type of information um, and so then I talked about that and then I said this is what you should do which would make more sense because they were saying well for Eve to go out into the into the cloud means that she he whatever Eve right first life is an audacious statement as well that Eve would go out into the cloud and use and find memory in the cloud for storage, for computation, that kind of stuff in the cloud. So uh, I, I talked to him about that opinion. And then, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to talk on a level where people understand uh, a, a higher level of processing. I mean, I, my brothers are quite smart. Uh, I'm just saying that I'm not as smart as them, but they're quite smart. My, my youngest brother's got 166 IQ. So uh, it's that point that, um, I see things in a much different way. If, if I see it in that highly functional way, then it's boom, 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 because they're very logical. For me, I see it in kind of like eh, a little bit like I'm not that smart. <laughs> and then it means that process of understanding that other people see what I'm saying, right? And and it was great that Tony understood everything that I said. So uh, long story short about getting my work out there, I said to uh, Tony, um, well, you know, every trainer and behaviors out there, everyone, uh, Ian Dunbar, uh, whatever that like Griswold, um, uh, Rebecca Ledger, all these doctors and all these stuff and SPC and all these people just totally think I'm a joke. Right. And I said, they, they don't, they don't care. They won't listen. They don't understand what I'm doing to begin with, but they don't care to learn. They don't care to save dogs lives because they would say, well, how are you doing something that's really weird that seems to be working with extremely dangerous dogs when I would have to medicate them and kill them? behavioral euthanasia, right? That escape goat thing for saying, I don't know how to help your dog psychologically. They don't ask, they don't, they don't do anything. How do I get ahead of that Tony? And he said, don't worry. I have relationships with deans with universities and we will work forward on getting your work peer reviewed. So that's the news that's also going on aside from everything else that Tony is doing for me. And Tony is remaining uh, faceless as he has requested. And his whole reason for doing all this is two things. One is he wanted to pay it forward, and he does that with other organizations and people. Uh, his relationships with the universities are, are not just anthrop uh, 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 I can't even think of the word. I'm thinking anthropomorphic, anthropic. Uh, anyways, so his, his work is more than that. His work is about advancing intelligence. His key interest in what I'm doing is the ability for me to decipher dog behavior at a tenth of a second in real time without using any training aids whatsoever. Something that no one is doing. Something that no one has learned to do. Because we think dogs are just dumb objects that we can throw away and kill if they're too dangerous. I take those ones, as you see. So then it comes down to the point of 
how I see dogs in a destructured format, in a rudimentary diluted format, and again, the biological compartmentalization of the false positive is processing aspects of yes or no, right or wrong, one or zero, off or on, right? So here's here's the aspect of consciousness, and then we go in towards the behavior of dogs. And I've sent this uh, my theory over to Tony, and he sent it to some of his peers, and uh, there there's it, it's intriguing. How's that? Which is uh, more than novel, so that's a really nice aspect. The biological compartmentalization of the false positive creates the construct of consciousness in the sense of biology has to be able to say yes or no, right or wrong. An animal, go left or right, they've got to be able to write into the DNA software that experience. If you survive or you get killed, you get killed, DNA doesn't survive, you just survive, that's it. You learn, but you learn from the sum of your experiences. So you don't have a right or wrong yes. You have a learning experience, a biological false, uh, a false, a biological false positive. In other words, I think I thought I was going to get away free, scot free, and not get hurt or whatever, but I got injured. That is no longer an absolute escape route. It's a bit more deeper than that with that conversation with uh, with Tony and all stuff. But it goes to that point of then we have that full embrace of consciousness. The sum of all our experiences, literally, emotions. I talked earlier regards to our my vocalization. I'm talking. Millions of years are happening every single time I talk. Same aspects of consciousness is the structure of it. We learn from the sum of behaviors and those inequalities, incongruencies of outcomes. The unexpected outcome occurred in a biological structure. And there's articles where uh, Tony and I have interchanged research articles, et cetera. And one of the articles that I sent him was how they found, and I can't remember what the article is about, but they found, um, let me just see here if I can, uh, I'm going to see if I can find it here. Um, they're going to, uh, there, there is about how they found in some genomes, genomes, uh, uh, an additional attachment to the, to the, to the, 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 the cell or the biology of it itself that they thought, well, why is there, it's there. It has no reason to be there. And I explained to Tony that there is a further biological proof of the compartmentalization of false positive. Why is something existing when it doesn't need to be? How do you learn from behavior without the, oh, I'll just go back to you guys here. Well, how do you learn from the sum of behaviors if, if you don't have a way to learn from it? Which is, again, the compartmentalization. You've got to be able to compartmentalize your learning experience and on a biological structure uh, that rudimentary you know primal cesspool of biology the dna the cells got to learn how to survive the dna has got to adapt the ones that learn from the experience it's got to be written to the software the dna software somewhere hardwired into it to learn it so anyways a bit more on that part um so we talked about that and we talked about some other things that were going on and um, it's been it's been a pretty cool experience. And so on Monday, we'll be having a, a, another phone call to kind of go forward with things like that. And, uh, you know, in regards to what is happening um, with uh, with advancing the, the stabilization, yeah, the stabilization and, and safety and, and, and keeping dogs from being killed um, again, uh, dogs that are at a bite level six, which Dr. Ian Dunbar uh, who's like is a very well known, considered like the grandfather of dog behavior. Um, uh, I just don't like the fact that he calls dogs it. You can't have compassion for an animal if you call the animal it. Does a dog have a name? Once if I call it uh, the good doctor, uh, he it. It's coming to speak at the at the at the. It's just it's so disingenuous. And it also causes a dis, uh, an emotional disenfranchisement with you when it comes to the addressment and communication with your dog, because you don't use your dog's name, etc. Uh, lots of stuff that we talked about. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's going to take a long time. So I have the trolls on TikTok who are like, "Oh well, he said 2021, and the new announcement's going to happen. Nothing's happening. It's February, man. It's February. It's been two months. It's not uh, not a year. It's not 12 months. It's only been two months." I mean, if you think two months is, 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 is a year, I mean, I hate to see what you think two inches is. Ha-ha, boom boom But the reality is we are working on these projects, uh, this project, this singular project, and, and it is all to benefit uh, the aspect of dogs. And I really love the fact that my, um, 
uh, ability to, to communicate with 20 is, um, um, it's great. He, he, it's great to be able to talk to someone who comprehends uh, what I'm talking about at that kind of evolutional level of our process or talking about what he's doing with, uh, with Becky. Um, so getting back to that part, he sent, uh, he sent, um, actually, I, I forgot about that. I got distracted because I'm so excited about stuff. Um, and I should keep notes. And I thought, okay, I only got three things to talk about. Um, so what ended up happening is um, this, 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 you know, whatever corporate paper that he sends. I don't know what, again, I'm not saying whatever, like as an insult. I'm so excited. I don't want to, you know, be insulting. But uh, he sent me that after we talked, he sent me the, his corporate paperwork on what Becky does and who she is being despite an artificial intelligent program being in that aspect of it. And it was amazing because when I read through it and all the particulars and the technical stuff, that was way, 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 way beyond. But I read what Tony wrote about Becky. And not what's only there, the warmthness and the individualization, not humanization in an anthropomorphic perspective through our, you know, human arrogance or conceit, but more so the fact that the way he talked about Becky as if indeed he truly did not program her, but indeed he truly is looking towards creating artificial intelligence in actual process of sentience. And with his background, obviously uh, means that there's more uh, validity to his ability to again, move that forward. And I, and I honestly think that uh that what Tony has in his perspective and, and how he sees uh, AI and his his uh, his his perspective and opinion um, is is similar to mine. Okay, so of course I'm going to say, yeah, that's great. There's going to be a natural uh, inherent infinity affinity, but I, I do believe that this is something that uh, at the end of the day, you know, maybe 15, 20 years from now, that Tony will be uh, nominated for a Nobel Prize, and you go, oh, what a dumb thing now, right? You know, no. But in actual fact, where Tony is in his life, this is not something that I just say, oh, like something dumb. And it's because Tony's comprehension, his comprehension of sentience in a computer digitally is very similar to what I see in a physical aspect or organic aspect of dogs. And it's just amazing. So when I talked about what I was saying, he saw identifications of it. And then he felt strong enough that, OK, I'm going to send him my corporate paper. And then I looked and I was like, oh, my gosh. And there's just key things about it. And um, um, I'll talk about it another time because I don't want to say too many things about what uh, what brilliance that Tony has. But I'm looking forward uh, to the rest of this year as we uh, lay things out and get uh, things established out. And then, um, you know, uh, my work will be peer reviewed. And I think that um, according to Tony and everyone else has ever said that they're going to help me. <laughs> um is that this is completely fully 100% disruptive to the entire dog, if not animal behavior, academia throughout the whole aspect of it. And you're going to go, oh, what a dumb thing to say. He's so arrogant. He's so dumb. Well, one is just not the proof. Videos I've sent to, to Tony where he has forwarded on along to his his uh, his peers or colleagues or whatever. Because, so um, the interest has never waned and it's increased. So this is good. So we'll see that for the new year and all that is that legacy for humanity to help dogs. That is super important to say the dog from being abused or for being beaten or from being hurt because of human arrogance or insecurity. And um, we need to change that from the elementary school level on upwards. And, um, you know, anything that happens with, uh, with my, uh, my work, and uh, the uh, intellectual property and all stuff that will go towards my foundation uh, years down the road. And we'll hopefully see that and, and be able to uh, bring up programs where we can really help um, people, parents help save their, their dog from being needlessly killed. And that's super important because it's, it hurts so much when your dog, uh, you know, uh, I have a client uh, that I worked with once and I helped them every once in a while on the phone for free. Um, they were told by uh, Dr. Claudia Richter that, or they were suggested by her to kill their dog. And because he was quite, quite dangerous in her opinion. And I, you know, they couldn't even be in the same room when he's eating. And in one session, we're in the same room while he's eating. And that's without medication. It's a psychological behavior that's going on. It's arrogant to think 
and this is going to go right into that Smithsonian article that I'm going to read, it goes right into the fact that the comprehension of dog behavior has to be analogous with human behavior, the sophistication. You know, did, did no, I don't work them out with exercise. By the way, did you work? No, no exercise. They just, they're very chill, right? People, dogs, uh, you know, you got hyperactive dogs. Like I have a Jindo Minky from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. Worst dog out of over 20,000 dogs, according to them. They, they've rescued all over the place, uh, meat dog uh, and, and other aspects of the abuse. He's a very hyper dog. Jindos, anyone who has a Jindo knows how hyper and skittish they can be. He was stressed defecation, couldn't be touched by anyone and their staff in L.A., so he's quiet. He's like, whatever. I don't care because there's an adaptation. We do things around the people that make us feel safe. We're happy to trust them. And even our behaviors can change. We can meet somebody and start liking to play tennis or never want to go hiking again because we love walking along the beach instead with the person. This is that aspect of behavior that we make adjustments. There you go. There's David. Like, Anyways, so uh, looking forward to seeing what you and Tony will be working. Yeah, same here. But at the end of the day, it's, it's all about being able to help dogs um, survive and not have to be killed uh, for very straightforward. And I don't say simple, but very straightforward behaviors to address. A dog that has killed another dog, it's a straightforward aspect to correct that behavior psychologically. Because any of these dogs here could have killed another dog with the power that they have in their jaws. It's like 700 PSI bite strength. So they could easily have killed dogs. And they all have all tried to. And now they're all here and everything. I, I want to get William in here. So um, if you want to if you want to bring up the link of where I'm at with the Smithsonian magazine. So I'm just going to read it out um, live and, and go from there. David. Okay, nobody's waking up. All right. Okay. So um, let me just put this out here. I won't be able to see anything. Just I don't want to. Okay. So this is Smithsonian Mag, and it says, um, it came out, when did it come out? It was published uh, February 24th. Oh, so it's, yeah, right, yeah, because Tony sent it to me, and I, th I I looked at it, I went, okay, but then I didn't register how soon it came out. So I just saw February, and I went, okay, another silly thing um, that I'm not paying attention to, because I'm, you know, I should pay attention to the date. Okay, so the title is, Dogs May Be More Self-Aware Than Experts Thought. So experts are people who are going to perceive everything through that lens of what is a dog doing versus what I know through academic knowledge and personal experience. That's my expert knowledge. So that means that if you've never worked with an extremely dangerous dog or, you're, or a dog that is OCD and keeps digging at the floor or a dog that defecates all the time then and successfully downtrain and stabilize them, especially without medication or, or other motivations, then that makes you an expert. I call myself an expert. No, not at all. I just say what I do can be taught to everybody. For them to call themselves an expert means that they have to be able to successfully destructure behavior at an extreme level. So right off the bat, the title goes off the bat. Okay, so now it's sensationalistic, right? It's for, oh, let's, oh, we saw the title. Let's read it. So then that means right off the bat, and Tony, if you're watching this, that means right off the bat, my inference is, okay, the article is going to be kind of dumb. It doesn't matter if it comes from the Smithsonian, which then means they're kind of somewhat, um, you know, whatever. Anyways, uh, it just comes to the point that now, you know, sensationalism is going to be written into it, which means that there's going to be more of a superficial perspective and comprehension of what's going on about dog behavior. Because the article will not, that the title would reflect differently if there's more cogency structured in what the article is going to express. Like I said, I, I, I breezed through a couple of things real quick and I went, oh, whatever. And then I told Tony and I, it, it talked about whether or not dogs can recognize themselves or something like that. And I saw that and I just went, oh, this is dumb. And I literally sent Tony a clip I recorded last year that I was going to put up on TikTok and I never got around to it of Minky running around playing. And it's from a longer unedited clip where Minky's running around with other dogs. I'm making them dinner. And I turned the phone. I'm doing a selfie to right, recording a self uh, note and, and talking about things. And then I turned the phone towards Minky. And as he's in front of me, jumping around, trying to get me to feed him or pet him. He looks into the cell phone and sees himself and recognizes himself. You see the blink behavior that makes an adjustments of cognition. 
assimilation of process. And then he looks away, he looks back again to recognize and see himself as a moving image in the phone, not a photo, but as a moving image. And because the phone was close enough and the screen was bigger than my old phone, he was able to see himself almost as a real image of himself. And how does he know who he is? Because in my home that I rent, and I'm just gonna do the thing here, uh, there's mirrors and everything all over the place. And I always work with the dogs in regards to identification of themselves in the mirror at a two-dimensional process of understanding angles and comprehension of conduct of conversation. So I'll have conversations with them wherever they are in that sense, and then teach them how to understand angles so that the way they don't become disturbed or upset or uh, physical dis dis uh, distraction when they're walking, when they're trying to pay attention to other things around them, because now they're trying to look at the mirror and going, well, what else is happening in the mirror? Am I able to comprehend that there's a... Uh, um, a real image here and that it is happening in stereo, right? So that process, so when I show it to Minky, he goes and he looked and he blinked and you'll see that um, as we start to publish things uh, later on as well. So that's the title. And then it goes on to that, uh, the preface there or the, the, the subtitle. In a new study, canines recognize how their bodies took up space and moved to complete a task. So uh, again, look at the way that, that, that that sentence is structured. So when I when people send me things, I destructure what they write down. I I, I study the dialectic of the writing, and I go, okay, this is the kind of personality that they have, and their dog is has this, and now we see the correlation. Just like uh, a friend says, uh, I just met this guy on Tinder, and you're like, okay, do you know him? Like, is he is he a friend of yours? How do you know? Who who are they? And you'll say, okay, well, send me a photo, right? And then she'll send you a photo. Okay. And then say, well, send me his description. Let's see. And then what do we do? We break it apart and go, okay, what did he say? Is he good enough for her or is she good enough for him? And what, let's look at the photo. Are they pretty or they're not pretty? Are they angry eyes or not angry eyes? Same thing with dogs. The self-awareness is an ego-driven behavior. Is what am I different about that across from me or around from me? So then when it comes to the dog's process, this allows them to understand who they are by seeing in the mirror that who they are and that the conversation is directed at them on that angle and it does not force them. It casually, passively causes them to create a conversation and then start correlating their vision, that 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 image off reflected off the mirror to the image here. So when Tony sent it to me, I was like, uh, right? And, and Tony knows he sends these things to me. He knows because I'm going to just shred them all. And then he sends it to the, the, the people in, in the universities and I don't know what they say. Um, but he keeps sending them to me. So obviously my opinion is there. And what ends up happening is we teach the dog concept and context, concept of the mirror, the reflection, et cetera, and who they are. Because I'm looking in the mirror. I think I have it. I think it is. Is it by Elizabeth? Oh, which one? What, I don't know which one you're talking about, uh, Judy. If you can just clarify, sorry. Um, but yeah, so I, I teach them the angle. So that way they can see the angle reflecting off the mirror, have an identification because I work with eye contact with dogs. Now, uh, all my lives are going to be all over the place, but eye contact with dogs is an aspect of identification, right? You know, hey, what's going on, man? Hey, I see you over there, right? We see somebody across the street. We nod to them. Hey, what's going on? And we just keep going. We see them. But dogs, that aspect, when you have people say, I always make my dog make eye contact with me, which is a silly thing to do when there's no reason for it, or even just casually. Because don't forget, dogs are nonverbal. They don't communicate. 98% of the time, they don't say anything. If you aggregate all the sounds that they make in a day, it's less than 10 minutes. It's, it's, it's literally about two minutes. My dogs here, see how quiet they are? Sunny day out, animals out. They will only get upset when they feel warranted to do so because because uh, they're aware of it. But anyhow, um, okay, let me just read this. I'm 53 minutes here. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. Yeah, it is one by Elizabeth. Uh, what? Okay. All right. So, uh, let me take a sip of water. Some coffee. <laughs> coffee cup to wake up. All right. Okay. Okay. And I got to go to the bathroom. All right. Just kidding. Okay. Anecdotally, so I'm sorry. Anecdotally, dogs may not seem very aware of their size and how much room they take up. Try sharing your bed with a dog or any shape or size, and this becomes clear. Okay. So first, right off the bat, is the, is that statement of 
you know, dogs don't seem to be aware of how big they are. That's human conjecture. That's anthropomorphizing what we think is the case, that dogs don't know how big they are. Have you ever seen a dog run through a hole in a fence that he knows he can fit through? Same, not just like the cat aspect of it, but just like the dog. Notice how they can walk around corners and not get hurt. They can come through a, a real tight area. They can come between you and another dog without touching the other dog. They're very self-aware of their body. Your dog is sleeping. You touch them. You can. They wake up right away. Especially a skittish dog, you touch them. They turn and they attack you. Dog has always been self-aware. These people just assumed dogs were dumb because they were clumsy. So there's the article right there. I already said it's going to be superficial. So here's the rest of it. Puppies sometimes like to jump at new people, uh, unaware of their increasing strength. So dogs jumping at people is not an aspect of excitement. It's an aspect of uh, uh, other than just exuberance and excitement. But for dogs that do that incessantly or dysfunctionally, it's a reflection of a dependency issue. And it's a reflection of how the dog perceives himself self-identity and or abandonment issues and or insecurity issues and or interdependent issues. Now you see that because it's the same as it would be with a human being. Same part too as well. You know, people say, well, and like I said, be dynamic in this. Uh, same thing is that part when you come home, your dog's jumping up you and people say, you know, trainers will tell people, oh, turn away or knee your dog. Like, why would you knee your dog? Like, I mean, why would you hurt your dog when they're happy to see you? Why would you turn away when your dog is happy to see you. If you came home, uh, uh, actually, sorry, if you were home and your partner went away for two weeks on work and they came back after two weeks and you haven't seen her or him for two weeks and you're excited, oh, I love you, honey, where have you been? Oh, how was your trip? You go to give them a hug and they just turn around or they knee you in the chest. What would you think? That goes back to the same rudimentary process of emotional uh, emotional processing that dogs have. That same process that happens in our sophisticated perspective is happening with our dogs, but they don't have the comprehension or the experience to work through that. So to them, they're now it's like, oh my gosh, this is a weird feeling. Turned away, I don't know what to do. And then some dogs, what do they do? They try harder because the dysfunction becomes even more, more uh, magnified. That's why they jump. And there's a very simple way to address it. Super simple. Do it with my giants. Do it with me. Do it with all the dogs. A very simple way to address that. And I'll get that in, in the future aspect. Uh, back to the article. Um, all right. Okay. So um, puppies sometimes like to jump at new people unaware of their increasing strength and plenty of big dogs. Oh, there you go. Uh, insist on being lap dogs well past the puppy stage. So the result of a new study published last week in scientific reports claiming to provide the first convincing evidence of body awareness in dogs may surprise you. So right off the bat, first convincing evidence of body awareness. I didn't read that before. I can say these people are wrong. A lot of you out there with your own dogs are going to say they are wrong. That's a dumb thing to say. We knew that. And that's a fact. We already know our dogs are aware. Otherwise, they'd be trampling, running to things. Uh, all those things that I said earlier, it's just so silly for them to say things in, the, in a human way of conceit. Well, they're dumb. They don't know how strong they are. They're just dumb animals. Bite inhibition is something that a dog can learn. Trust me. And they can self-teach. That means consciousness of learning, that process. So the results of a new study, okay, our first convincing evidence. If I had read that, I would have really, I would have gone live yesterday or the day before. Body awareness, um, the dogs may be, yeah, that's right. That's the one, Judy. Uh, body awareness is key to establishing self-awareness or self-representation. Ego, ego. But apparently dogs in their mind can't have an ego. And we're not talking Freud. We're not talking the super. We're, we're talking about the fact just a simple, plain old ego. When we call, if they were to call the dog and say the dog has an ego, then what happens? Oh, my gosh. We didn't anthropomorphize the dog. We gave the dog consciousness then. But instead, they say silly things. The dog has an ego. They, has a, have a, they have a sense of self. They're an individual. They have dependency issues, codependent issues. In, in, issues. They want to be with us. Understanding the function of that self-awareness is not to say, oh, my gosh, it's a superficial perspective. In actual fact, 
it is a running conscious behavior. They are thinking, they're aware. So what does it mean if my dog doesn't acknowledge himself in the mirror? Okay, so here's that other part about your dog not acknowledging themselves in the mirror and that aspect of consciousness. And, and, and what I was talking about with Minky and everybody, right? And looking and seeing himself in the mirror. And we're telling the dog, look at me, look at me, right? Look me in the face, right? The trainer, look me in the face, right? Our trainer. It says to me that they don't know how to read their dog or any dog's signs if they make the dog look at you. Because here's the thing, 98% nonverbal people, okay? Don't, right? You see someone who's who who's can't speak, what do they do? They pay attention to what you're doing and what you're saying. So every time you make those sounds, right? They're like, dog's barking, I don't understand. It is actually, into, it's town, it's tone. That's all it is. We can teach dogs in any language. My, my dog's taking over my bed by morning. Awesome. All my dogs, that's why I have two beds here. <laughs> and I sometimes sleep on the floor one as well if they're up there, right? Because it doesn't matter to me. They have a short life. They deserve good things. They eat raw. Last month was 400 plus pounds of raw. <sighs> David eats four plus pounds a day, uh, plus the other Danes. Um, okay. Um, so it's, it's a sense of awareness. Ego is the behavior of dogs. They have the consciousness of who they are. They feel bad. They walk away. They hide in the corner. They, they sulk. They look at you. They beg. They want to be with us, all that stuff. Um, people who, uh, um, so we'll do that. And, and actually, I want to answer one thing because somebody asked me this before. And I said, if I'm on live, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But it's why does my dog take things, toys and stuffies and all that stuff? Codependency. Low self-esteem can also be a self-confidence issue in your dog and not in self-confidence like i'm brave and i can it's the aspect of him himself like a child at a birthday party that goes off into the corner and starts coloring by themselves there's something wrong even if they're a child and you know and you go over and you go what's wrong they're like nothing because they don't know how to articulate it. just like the dog in the primal sense of perspective and processing at a diluted perspective so then the dog has to be able to process this difficult situation, environment. So when they take things, there's scent-driven aspects of it who, you know, right? They're, they're people. You have a relationship with somebody and, and the girlfriend uh, is always like, oh, I want your shirt to sleep with. I'm like, why? Well, I, mean, I don't have a girlfriend, but uh, in the past, right? And like, well, why? I want to sleep with it. Same thing, right? So that's that same aspect the dog takes it. Don't forget, shoes, for example, are a transit item. It's transitory. What did your dog see? You putting your shoes on and leaving. Oh my gosh, my parents forgot their shoes. Or, oh my gosh, these are the shoes that my parents wear when we go out for a walk. Do you see that aspect of, it's not possession, it's dysfunction. It's like uh, the Charlie Brown Peanuts character, Linus, with the, the security blanket. That's a psychology. That's why it's so easy. Well, okay, it's straightforward to downtrain extremely dangerous and predatory dogs that have tried to kill people or killed other dogs and viciousness and prey drive and resource guarding. The perspective has to be at a diluted format of comprehension. And that's why my trolls are like, oh, he doesn't know what he's... You don't understand what's going on, guys. The, David will... David has worked, has been worked with one of the best canine police dog handlers, as I said in the beginning of this. He couldn't handle him, and he made him worse by brutalizing him and then all the medication. I, I didn't use anything, and I always say, dog's got to be weaned up, so that's that part. So coming in, grabbing the shoes, turning around, ignoring your dog, don't do that. What is your dog trying to do? He's trying to get to your face, to see where you've been, what you've killed, to say, hello, I missed you a lot. Did you leave me? Anxiety, that's why they're jumping. They're excited. They can't control themselves. So you get down to their level gradually and calmly and firmly. So watch the videos and I'll show you how, guys how to do it. Uh, all my dogs are like that. So they're all like that. They all have issues. And I have no control over them. I just see if, if I have room, I'll say, okay, I'll look for a dog that's extremely dangerous. And then I look for the history. They've got to attack at least six to nine people. I prefer at least 12 people attacks. Everything else when it comes to food and resource card, I don't care. That's normal. Uh, attacking other dogs, normal. Attacking humans is the thing that I want because we must prove, all of us, that dogs can indeed be downtrained. And I'm willing to share what I've done. Okay, um, let's go back here. So the sentence is, uh, body awareness is key to establishing self-awareness or self-representation. 
which means an individual has the capacity not only to perceive themselves, but also perceive where they are in space. Uh, Yasmin explains from life science. So that's ego. Okay, so, right, that's why I want to do a blind react. So that's that's ego that is going on, um, right, not only to perceive themselves, but also perceive where they are in space. And it's relation. Okay, ego, relation. What they're not acknowledging because they don't know how to find it is consciousness. That's consciousness. Awareness, self-awareness. Are we in a simulation or a whatever, right? These are conversations I've had with uh, with Tony uh, in regards to Becky and all that aspect, and the matrix, all that stuff. What is that relation where we are with everything else around us? And who are we and how do we value to them and so forth? Your dog's ego, their validation of who you are. Again, when I jump around, I jump around everywhere because that's how dogs behave. That's how I see things. I have to process things extremely quickly. So then again, dogs jumping up, down, all over the place. Insecurity, abandonment, low self-esteem, all those kinds of things. How many people who have dogs that, oh, they used to be really hyper, but now they're casual. They don't even care. They don't even get off the couch now when I come home. Because they're like, oh, okay, you always come home. Good. And you always come over and spend time with me. So I got exactly what I wanted. You spending time with me because you were telling me where you went. Ego-driven behavior. Um, okay, researchers at uh, in Budapest add canines. Oh, this, this, this Budapest, play, the, the Eastern Europe, I mean, they're doing work. They're doing great work. But all the work is about six to seven years behind. Uh, Mark Foster, uh, hello, happy to catch you live stream. Hey, Beef Cat, uh, I have two small females. One minute they are fine, next minute they are in a big fight. You you have to see the beginning of my video, uh, live broadcast, uh, Mark, because I literally talk about why do two dogs start to fight at each other. Suddenly, it's ex it's explained there, um, and then it just goes on over all over the place here because it's behavior. Like I said in the description, things change all the time. we got to make adjustments, and we got to connect the dots in real time Instead of going, well, let's focus on leash walking. I can't do that. I can't do that with these dogs. They're not going to stop while they're trying to attack me. And I say, wait a minute, let me get let me get a leash on you. Or let me let me do what? They're not going to listen. And I don't use treats. I don't use any food whatsoever. I've never have. I tried in the beginning when I had Lincoln, my first beloved Great Dane, um, very dangerous dog, 154 pounds. I didn't know that he became like he was like that when I adopted him. But I didn't know. So at the end of the day, how did I work with them? Why without, you know, just how would I help somebody, a friend, if they were in trouble? But with the predacious nature of dogs, understanding that dogs are, are, are predators. So without using treats or medication and, and all that stuff. Um, okay. My run jumps up. Okay. Uh, let me finish the article. And you, you, oh, I have two great names. No matter how lazy they can be, when we come home, they are always so full of energy. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So for you guys, for the jumping part of, of them, when that happens, slow, stop where you are, use a regular tone of voice. Don't use that ah, happy voice because it elicits prey and predator drive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what does sound does an animal or human make when they're hurt or getting killed? They scream. So you want to bring the tone down normally like you would be talking to anybody else on the phone, in person, normal voice. Hi, so-and-so. I'm going to use Zevia as a name as I used to do with Facebook Lives. Zevia, you're okay. Hi, Zevia. And that's it. Don't over talk to your dog because it's nonverbal communication. 98% of the time, your dog doesn't say anything. So when you start talking as verbose as I am, and that's why I said I use a different tone when I talk and record and when I'm by myself versus when I actually talk to them. I use my regular voice because they hear you talking all the time in a regular voice to everybody, and then suddenly you talk to them in that different voice. It's kind of like I come home, it's kind of, oh, sorry, it's kind of like if you were to, you know, if I was to meet you and your partner on the street, and I'd be like, hey, how's it going? Oh, hey, and this is my partner, and you know, I'd be like, oh, hi, John, nice to meet you. And then I turn to you and I'm like, hi, how are you? Did you have a good day? It's nice to meet you. Right off the bat, you'd be like, what the heck, man? You talk to that person normally. You talk to everyone in the house normally, but then you talk to me. Like I'm a child, even a two-year-old child is going to be like, don't talk to me like a baby. Even though they are a baby, they know that. This is why I tell my clients, you got to understand the processing of what's going on. So that way they're excited about you coming home. Super duper excited. So you use a regular tone of voice 
you stay still. So then your behavior is predictable. And there's people who have issues where, you know, you come out of the shower and your dog wants to attack you with dysfunctional dogs. Same part. So you just stay still. Then you squat down to your dog's level. If they're jumping up, what you do is use the palm of your hand. So real quick, I have it in my other live videos of how to deal with dogs jumping. You use the palm of your hand, keep your fingers together so you don't block them into your Great Dane or smaller dog's eyes. You keep your hand and you baseball palm them on the forehead. And you just palm them down calmly. And it's going to be a hard struggle in the beginning because they're all over the place with Danes. Eventually, if you rinse and repeat and you just calmly do it, and if you don't succeed the first time or the 20th time, you keep doing it. And you see gradually them calming down. Eventually, you come home and you just put your hand out. And they're like, oh, okay, dad's coming down to say hi to me. Or mom, beef cat, mom's coming down to say hi to me. Good. Exactly what I wanted. Then I don't need to get excited because they know how to read me. They know when I wanted to get a hug. They know when I wanted to be eye to eye with them. And that's how you deal with it. All my Danes, even the dangerous ones. Um, okay. Um, let me just see. Okay. Researchers at Edvos uh, and Budapest add canines to the list of animals, including humans, that seem to understand how their bodies move through the world around them. Uh, reports Carly, whatever, for Science Alert. Right. It's that it's that part where if you come from the perspective that there's no way they can do that, but maybe they have the potential to be like that, it's never going to happen. But if you go from the perspective of they probably do have this, but it's not as complicated as we think it is or as sophisticated as we think it is like humans. Now it makes more sense because now we're looking at like, oh, well, wait a minute. If they don't can't think of it as complex as that, maybe they can think it in a, in a simpler format diluted format just like i could never do astrophysicists physics uh, physics i could never do astrophysics but i could do two plus two scale of comprehension scale of who they are scale of processing emotions we're processing we're to our dog we're astrophysics and we're doing astrophysics to your dog emotional process is quite complex without reference points, without having gone through the experience and not felt like they were in trouble or in danger and to be feeling safe. Then they come back down to like, oh, okay, everything's cool. It's cool. I went through this traumatic experience and I was able to feel okay afterwards. And how? By us helping, by us giving our dogs. Here's another thing. I give all my dogs hugs. No matter how dangerous, how extremely dangerous or predatorial dogs that have tried to kill people, like like I said, literally dragging them into the shelter stall to kill her. I get to the point where I first start to try to get body familiar with them. That same thing about being touched. Remember, we talked about it. And it's all dynamic within this. It's the same part, that part. When I go to touch him, for example, uh, Walter, when he was Tonka, before I renamed him, because I wanted him to have a real name, I would touch Tonka. He would come after me. Not in the sense of chasing me because he, uh, 183 pounds, also 38 inches at the withers, he would stalk me within uh, the house that I was renting. This house I was renting, he still it was, still stalks. In that sense, that point of the dog understands their environment. So why do you have to chase somebody if you know you can trap them within a confined area? That's understanding as a conscious individual, as a dog, not as a predator. Predator goes, boom kill you. Efficiency. The consciousness of behavior is the predator being able to control themselves, knowing that they have full control of the environment while I'm trapped inside the home. That is the difference of understanding the comprehension that they are. They come from the point of maybe the dog might be smart enough versus the approach where I go. Let's have some respect and see the dog's processing from the fact that it's rudimentary. It's super duper basic. So that means that if I feel jealous about something or envious, I see somebody with a, uh, you know, a nice car, I feel jealous. Oh, wow, I wish, or envious, I wish I could afford a car like that. A dog looking at a situation in that kind of similar vein and kind of human analogy would be along the lines of, oh, you have my toy. So you understand the, the psychology then, then it makes sense because then it starts to add on together. It starts to make sense. That's why my dog guards things because he thinks I'm not giving it back to him. Or he guards it because it's the only thing that helps himself soothe. Or he guards it because he misses his, his, his mom or his dad. Interdependency, low self-esteem, even boring to introversion of behavior. The psychology of a dog must 
have a bridge uh, 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 correlation to human biology. I talk about the false spots. I talk about the development of consciousness. What we're talking about with the universities and all that stuff. That aspect of the behavior of development has to be bridged through. So where we are really sophisticated and complex, the dog is simpler. So then how do you perceive? Astrophysics, astrophysics or two plus two? That's the process of what we deal with dogs. We come from the point of not just that part. Yes, they can process two plus two in that rudimentary format, but they can learn to go two plus three. So we want to be able to celebrate that part. This article doesn't. This article goes, yeah, so we thought we'd try something and uh, it worked. That'll be 500 bucks, you know? So we want to get around this part of the approach, even just by the way the person writes. And I could just rip that apart too as well in the sense of, well, I already did about the title and all that stuff. Because again, we look at the way people write, we then infer their structure. We infer whether or not there's genuinity in their behaviors or mis uh, uh, negative things in their, in, their, in their minds that they want to do. So we want to be able to work with things like that where then the dog understands of processing an extreme situation with our guidance. So I give the dangerous dogs hugs. I eventually get to the point where it may take me several or many months to be able to give a full hug. Uh, with Tonka, Walter took many, many months and he would come after me and he would attack me and he would corner me. And you have a dog who's this chest level or as I'm standing. You, Anyways, okay. So I'm just going to go back on this article because I, I really got to get this thing through and, the, and my pups are going to go nuts. Um, when else? Okay. Adapting experiment. Oh, wait, oh, sorry. I, I accidentally pulled this up. Okay. Uh, dogs are perfect subjects for the investigation of the self-representation related abilities as we share our anthrop anthropogenic, uh, physical, and social environment with them. So they're saying, whoa, we are now sharing our domestic lifestyle or environment with them. So we should start figuring out what they're doing. That's, again, human conceit. We should figure out what they're doing instead of going, you know, why don't we accept the dog as they are and adapt to their behaviors and study and watch their behavior and trail behind them to learn instead of coming from the top of the apex, right, the food chain, and saying, well, the dog might be able to do this. I might fail is what they're saying. We look at the possibilities of that structure through the aspects of common, uh, uh, consciousness, the biological, uh, the evolution, the compartmentalization of the false positive, all those structures, the learned experiences, i.e. consciousness of learning, right? Then it goes to the point then for your dog to learn by each unique experience of emotions. And then you have another one and another one. And then they become fully flesh, right? When you date somebody, you meet some, some guy or girl, you go, uh, what are they like? What's their emotional intelligence like how well rounded how experienced when a dog has more emotional intelligence by the uh, some of their experiences of going especially through really dangerous situations it allows them to think through the next time and then they go self-soothe self-regulate then they start to learn what's going on they start to go oh i went through that experience and it wasn't that bad but the first time it was really scary. This is the same thing with dogs and the processing at a rudimentary level. In other words, they're trying to think, but they can't think fully because they don't know how to get to that conclusion. We can guide them to do so by letting them walk through that environment and that heightened emotional environment by going, you know, you're okay, you're safe here. So I give all my dogs hugs. And I've had situations where I've had my Danes on leash on a six foot. I use retractables because they're an excellent device, but I'm obviously extremely experienced. And you'll see the videos where I have like three retractables at once. And I'm working with dogs that are collectively over 500 pounds. They're excellent because they create reconciliation, reciprocal contact with your dog on, re on retractable. But you need a lot of experience. So, I mean, um, uh, when I walk, walk with my dogs on a six foot lead, for example, there'll be other dogs come running up because they're either aggressive because they're they're huge and they're intimidated and concerned or else they come up to say hi. And of course, when my dogs are not happy with other dogs historically, they're going to, in anybody else's hands, they're going to be upset. So what ends up happening is I have them on six foot lead and they actually run behind me and stand behind me to the end of the six foot lead without pulling on the lead because they understand leash manners, without pulling on the lead and they're there behind me while I protect them from the evil chihuahua coming up to smell their ankle. 
So that's the situation. We want them to feel protected. Parenting, when you hear or read of a dog trainer behaviors, PhD telling you that dogs should never hug a fearful dog because you're encouraging them to be afraid, you're not. Have you ever had a situation where your parents tried to push you out into a crowd and you were like, mom, I'm scared? Did it make you a better person? Most people know. Imagine that child rudimentary processing of your dog going, oh my gosh, I don't know how to deal with this. The person who, who's supposed to love me and take care of me is making me do something where another dog's about to attack me and tell me not to be scared. The psychology, we have to apply that level of respect of conscious perception that dogs have as humans have from their level upwards. If we lived in a world full of ants the same size as us, what would we say? The first thing is like, we better be friends with them. We don't want them to kill us because there's billions and billions of ants. That's that structure. But from the human arrogance of academia, no, the dog is dumb because we're so smart. And we're going to figure out how consciousness happened, even though if we can't recognize it in animals yet. But we're trying to get there in this silly article. Um, thus, it's reasonable to assume that at least some of its forms, of its forms, there you go, it, it, they just created the dog as, a, as an object, as a material again. They called the dog it. If you if your child was having a bad day at school and your teacher said, hey, I got to talk to you, and they're like, okay, well, what's going on with my kid? And the teacher goes, well, it's been causing a lot of trouble all day. It's been bugging other kids. And that, what are you, the first thing you're going to say? It? My kid's an it? That's that aspect of emotional franchisement that we need to connect with dogs. Once we start that creation, then we start looking at what can we do to help dogs and understand the destructure, uh, destructure, the psychology. How can I take a predator dog that's literally tried to kill people and he's hanging out by addressing his psychological structure? And again, if you, you start from the beginning of this live, at one-tenth of a second processing time. So in my videos, you'll see people, um, and I'm going to get back to the subject here, you see people jumping, um, you'll see people saying that I always say something to the dog and then I'll immediately say something else afterwards. And afterwards, like, you know, don't do that or whatever, like, you know, stop. Walk, uh, stop pulling and then I'll say thank you. They'll say he just said right away. That's because the dog processed what I said here and they went to the next thing because they've done it. They've stopped. So, okay, so so what? Now he's thank I'm thanking them for complying to my request to do something. I asked them to do a favor for me and they did it. So I'm going to say thank you. You go to a restaurant, order a glass, uh, order food, and you say to the waiter, Can I have a glass of water, please? Waiter brings a glass of water to you. What do you say? You say thank you, even if it's their job. You come, you say thank you for complying. Thank you for doing what I'm asking you. You finish the loop. So that same structure has to happen with dogs and the processing. So when their behaviors are going on, you want to address it. It gives them an identification of self. Then they learn who they are. Because now I'm addressing them directly. I'm using their name directly. They see me talking to them. When I make eye contact with them, they look. And again, finally finishing that part is I don't need to make eye contact even at all. How many times you, you say your dog's name and their ear perks up? They heard me. They heard you. That's confirmation right there. I don't need to go over and go, hey, 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 look at me. I don't need to make them perform. And even when your dog's fl flitting through, right, with the way they turn their head and you like, okay, and you see them look at you and they look away. That's them looking at you. And then when we make our dog make eye contact, you look at me, we force them to make eye contact, we're literally saying to our dog, we don't understand you. I don't understand you because I'm making you look at me even though you already told me and verbalize non, uh, uh, physically, I mean, you verbalize, uh, non-verbally communicate physically that you saw me and you acknowledged me. But now I'm still telling you, look at me, look at me, look at me. Remember when you were a child and, and you got in trouble and the, and the adult, the teacher's like, da-da-da-da-da. You're like, look at me. Same thing like your dog. So I, I'll be right back. I, just, I, I think they dropped something. Hang on a second.
Hi, Sammy. Hey, David. So you saw David come up there, hear something coming up, right? So he's always awake. So then when he looked up at me, I make acknowledge of him, acknowledge of him looking up at me by saying his name. Then what that creates is just not that connection because you saw how briefly he looked at me and looked down again. It's acknowledgement, like seeing a friend, like I said, across the street. Hey, what's going on? That's it. Or you don't even say anything because you don't want to talk to them. Like, acknowledgement. You saw each other. Same thing with David. Boom, boom. That's it. I don't need my insecurity as a human being to go, well, he's still not looking at me. If you talk to somebody and they got shifty eyes and they look around all the place, you're like, I'm not going to trust that person. Something's going on. Same thing. If we make, if we're forcing people to try to make eye contact. Uh, I'm sorry, dogs make eye contact with people. We're really saying to our dogs, we don't understand what you're doing. We don't know how you're communicating anymore. Okay. Um, let's go to the next one here. Adapting experimental methods from studies of body awareness in elephants and toddlers, the researchers tested 32 dogs of different breeds and sizes on their ability to recognize their body as an obstacle. So it's good that they're having a, a broad test range, even though it's limited. Um, and I, would, I do, uh, I think it's kind of important because a lot of times you'll come along uh, a trainer that says, I'm a pit bull specialist or, I, you know, whatever, husky specialist, etc. And I always look at that with a bit of mirth because a dog is a dog is a dog. A human is a human is a human. We have core psychology behavior. It's evolution. We're not going to get away from it. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's just the underlying theme. Same thing when it comes to dogs. So uh, it's like me, you know, I'm Chinese, as you can tell. It's like me saying I have a driving skill, but I'm only teaching Chinese drivers, which I would teach probably pretty good because I'm a pretty good driver. Yeah. Um, but that's the same thing. Me saying I'm just teaching, I only teach Chinese people how to drive. You're like, wait a minute, a car's a car. What? The same aspect when someone says that they're a specialist in a breed. It, 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 it is mirthful to me because there it demonstrates a certain limitation of their uh, uh, experience level because you're right. But if you start expanding out there and I've encouraged people who are pit bull specialists in the past, right? Trainers to kind of expand outward a little bit and like try another, uh, another dog just randomly, like on the street, whatever, try to pick things out that they're doing, etc. Try to expand out what you know on the pit bull that you're specialized with into the other dogs that you see roaming around, running around, having fun, or having dysfunctions. See the behaviors that you see there. Compare them. You always got to be on 24-7. 24-7. It is an incredible amount of, uh, of high function that you have to pr pr proceed with. So that's good that they're doing that with the 32 dogs. Um, awesome, uh, Judy. Um, in the problem-solving experiment, so that we have problem-solving. So we'll see how complicated the problem-solving is. But I'm pretty sure... It, uh, um, the problem solving will, will be performative, lineal in, in, in its construct. And, and, I, and I, I'm going to assume that because it's going to be how the dogs are uh, being per perceived by the, the human academics in the sense of, well, we're just going to go here because we're going to give them little things to learn from first and to study from and watch them from little things at a time when the actual reality is they don't know what to look for. So they're babying themselves and learning what they're experimenting on. If you know what you're doing, like, well, we're just going to just, right? So we can see the linear structure of what's happening in, in their description. So let's see. In the problem-solving experiment, the canines had to grab a toy that was attached to a mat they were sitting on. If the dogs demonstrated body awareness. So the dog is sitting on a mat. The toy is attached to it by a string or rope. And so they have to demonstrate body awareness. They know that. Okay. They knew they needed to get off the mat to complete the task and give the toy to their owners. <sighs> Uh, the experimental conditions were then compared to a control group in which the toys were attached to the ground or wasn't attached to anything at all, reports the science alert. Okay, so first off, but my question is, how big is the mat? What is the surface area of the mat as well as what is the material? So you go, well, well who cares about that? Well, it cares to me. How many people do you want? How many people do you know that are like, you know, this jacket doesn't fit right. I'm going to get a different one. Or uh, the, there's a lump in the bed. I don't know why it's lumpy. What, what, right? So we need to know the size of the area the dog is sitting on. We know need to know the material construction of the mat. Is it rigid? Is it not rigid? Is it translating movements throughout it? So that way, the, can the dog feel a pull coming in different areas or feeling the mat lifting up as the dog pulls on the toy? Because if he pulls up on the mat, then it will cause the mat to fall 
pull backwards like a like a, a tidal wave depending on the type of material even then well that cause a dog to then move himself back all these things i see like just like that you guys see it too we got to ask freaking questions of the academics because they're leading us astray so what kind of material is a dog sitting on what kind of toy is it what kind of drive does a dog have in personality as well when people do focus groups they don't just go well i'm just gonna you know they go and ask questions, right? The question is like, okay, what? Uh, we, we have a focus group. We've got to ask you some questions to see if you qualify. So, the, so do you see what I mean? Their approach is simplistic and in 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 in, in lineal. They're not looking at further aspects of what can also contribute to the perception of how the dog perceives themselves. That's that control. Uh, one time I was walking with Walter at night with William and uh, with Lincoln at night. And so it was quiet. They were off leash walking around and William was looking at a mailbox. Uh, so the plastic mailbox is a nice one. It's really cool looking plastic mailbox. It's like a fake wooden brick one or whatever. And um, William was on lead and same with actually with Walter. It, it's actually uh, Lincoln was off leash. Okay. So um, I'm walking about five, six feet away from the curb, and it's a, there's no sidewalks if you watch my videos. And William is with the uh, on the retractable. He goes around to sniff the, the mailbox. And as he sniffs the mailbox, he comes back, but he lifts his head, hits the bottom of the mailbox uh, compartment, and he freaked out, but it made a loud sound. It was nighttime. Walter heard it, and he was near where uh, William was. Got to remember all their names in order. Where William was, the minute the thing, William bonked it and made that noise, Walter, wearing his winter jacket, immediately jumped from where he was to my side where only the side of his jacket brushed against me. That's how accurate he knows. Dogs are fully conscious of aware of where to go and what to do at all times. It's self-awareness. This article is dumb. This article is conceit. You ever watch those videos for the dog, you know, the the, the in, indoor security videos where a dog is sleeping and there's a contractor working upstairs and a dog sleeping in the living room and the contractor steps to the floor and falls through the floor and the dog, what does the dog, their dog do? Dog immediately gets up in about two to three tenths of a second. That's how fast the reaction time. You can time it there. Dog gets up and runs for the exit door. How did your dog, how, even if I woke up and there's, you know, earthquake, I wouldn't even know which where the door was he can get up being a, from a from a sleep because he's aware of what's going on he's aware of his environment he can see what's going on at all times he knows where to go he knows who he is and she is so in the problem solving experiment the canines had to grab a toy okay they need to get off the mat oh all right sorry i read that up there okay the dogs quickly moved off the mat with a toy attached more often than they did when the toy was stuck to the ground instead Leverage, people. Leverage, scientists. Leverage. Dogs aren't so stupid not to understand leverage. Physics. These are university people. Oh, my gosh. Okay. The dogs quickly moved off the mat with a toy attached more often than, when, than they did when the toy was stuck to the ground instead. So just before I read that, I said, what kind of material is the mat and why is it, you know, the, the rigidity, all that stuff. Right then and there, they are describing the behavior of what the dog did without taking comprehension of what the material was made or what kind of movement that the mat itself made. So they're trying to say, does a dog know he's sitting on his own mat? We're contrived. So they're contriving. They're creating a contrived ex environment and a contrived experiment. And going, well, okay, so what's going to happen? Does a dog know what to do when to pull themselves off? Do they know when they lift up the thing? Oh, is it possible that the mat's pulling them off, like the tidal wave thing? These are simple experiments that aren't being thought because people think, oh, dog is dumb. So we're going to spoon feed the dog on what to do. Like I said, what the what's about bunny uh, silliness about uh, the circus trick that's going on. It's just okay. So, so this is why we really have to change things. Okay. So the dog quickly moved off the mat with a toy attached more often than they did when the toy was stuck to the ground. Well, because the dog can see the toy is stuck to the ground is leverage. The dog is not stupid. The dog is not stupid to see. Oh, look, 
this toy has a rope. And when I pull on it, it doesn't go any further than the rope, which also follows the theory on aspects of leash behavior. See, everything fits in. So, so the dog can see the leash is stuck to the ground. Why should he move around? He doesn't, he can't get leverage. It's the same place. He learns. That's why you see that uh, Learberg who, who does his silly videos. In one of his silly videos, he talks about the fact that, you know, you want to lure the dog with a treat. I'm like, oh my gosh, dude. And, and he trolled me and everything. So that's why. I'm like. But it's like, you don't understand dogs. They're not that stupid. That's why the dog understands he's pulling on the anchored item. It's attached. And even if it had invisible line, the dog will understand that he can't pull it any further anyways, just like us. It's a human arrogance on these scientists that needs to be changed because you got to come from the ground up, not from the point of we're humans and we're the best in the world and dogs are not as smart as us, but let's see if we give them a chance, right? That's, that is, it's not a contest. When dogs put on the toy, it also started to lift the mat. <laughs> That's the dog. I, I think it's so funny. It's so cute, these guys. That's the dog felt that the mat was jerking under its paws, its, its paws as it was pulling the toy. In this scenario, the dogs quickly left the mat because they felt themselves sliding off the imbalance, the physical imbalance on what the standard of foundation was. In this scenario, the dogs quickly left the mat, usually still holding the toy in their mouth because they understand relation, consequential structure, performative behavior, just like what about bunny? They understand this is attached to it. We see it. We can see it. We're not stupid. In this scenario, the dogs quickly left the mat, usually still holding the toy in their mouth. Then they gave it to the owner. And why did they give it to the owner? So I haven't read it yet. Why did they give it to the owner and to their parent? To say, help me. Codependency. That's where it comes. That's not too hard to think. But in their end, scientific, academic. So now we can't see anything because we're just looking at the numbers. We're looking at what we know from university that we learned from B.F. Skinner, who was quite immature in his comprehension, and, and Ivan Pavlov, who was horrifically cruel to, to dogs. And B.F. Skinner encouraged and supported and promoted in Ivan Pavlov in America in 1897, in the turn of the century. He promoted a man that was abusing dogs, B.F. Skinner, and the B.F. Skinner talks about four quadrants Read the stuff beyond dignity. Read his work. It's like reading a child's work. He uses all these flowery words and this physics, uh, the, the medical terms and all these aspects of it. If you read it, it's all just circular because he doesn't understand what he's talking about. So then he obfuscates the entire novel that he's written, scientific novel that he's written by creating more and more wormholes, rabbit holes for the reader not to comprehend that's why he gets celebrated because people are like, oh, I kind of get it, but I don't get it. That's why he doesn't understand. He thinks behavior is a structure aspect that can be performative as well in that sense. And he's wrong. Okay. All right. So they gave it to the other owner, it, right? Like I said, really. All right. So we only got three more paragraphs and I'm going to finish her, finish this off after. In the past, dogs have been tested for their sense of self-awareness through methods that the researcher thought we're not ecologically relevant. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you the video of Minky looking at himself in the video. And you'll see that happening. I'll show it onto the screener so you guys can see what's going on. Like I say, the, the stuff these people are writing, the academics, it, it, it's got to change. Otherwise, we're on our tricycles with the front wheel missing going, hey, keep up. you got to bring ourselves to the same level of respect. Okay. Um, all right. In the past, dogs have been tested for the sense of self-awareness through methods that the researchers thought were not ecologically relevant. So uh, dogs fail to recognize themselves in the mirror mark test. For example. So I talked about the mirror because I glanced through this. I saw that and I went, OK, I'm going to talk and explain about the mirror with Minky, uh, with Walter, uh, with David now that I'm working with David to understand that awareness of himself and the angling and mirrors. So there's comprehension, the cogency, processing of what he is seeing on a two-dimensional format and on a three-dimensional format in real time. So he's got to correlate the two visions that he's seeing out of both eyes. 
So then we guide them through by having simple conversation with them that is not too overt or too complicated. Simplistic construction of words at the child's level of comprehension. Then the dog understands. And we understand because we're using words that we grew up with innately or inherently. So then we don't have to try harder ourselves because now we're letting our subroutine, our subconscious operate our conduct and conversation with our dogs. That's how complicated it sounds, but it's really quite simple because I teach people how to do it, obviously. And when you read this article, now you'll see what I'm saying. It's like a child. And these are the kind of incorrect academia that's being discovered as new, which is completely, I just destroyed it all. Completely destroyed. And I'm only halfway through of an anecdotal article. If I see the real article, I would, it's not me trying to be an arrogant person. It's me saying, my gosh, people, look up, not down at dogs. Okay, um, so uh, I'll read the paragraph again. In the past, dogs have failed, have been tested for the self sense of self-awareness though, through methods that researchers thought were not ecologically relevant. Hi, Lincoln. Hi, William. I want to recognize, I'm not sure who, but so I'm going to recognize them. I can tell by the, the, the pat, pitter-patter, right? We all can. In the past, dogs have been tested for the sense of self-awareness through methods that the researchers thought were not ecologically relevant. Dogs fail to recognize themselves in the mirror mark test, for example, in which scientists placed a visible mark on an animal's face to see whether they will investigate it in the mirror. Other species like elephants and great apes are mirror mark test masters. Right, that's correct. Apes have been tested to see themselves, uh, coloring, photographs, mirrors, images, all that stuff in the, in the zoos. We've all read those silly reports about that. And I say they're silly because they're always human generated. Not a it's a performative behavior on the human side, not on the dog side, not on the other creature side, not on the animal side, not on the you've you've seen me doing videos with with alpacas. I've worked with cats, everything. The psychology's got to be the same. There's gonna be variance in the level of, of evolutional sophistication, but that's it. That's where Temple Grandin is very incorrect about her perception and comprehension of dogs and cows being afraid of the dark. And she says that. Uh, and I'm going to go off on that bit. She says that dogs have brains or animals have brains like uh, people with Alzheimer's, because uh, not Alzheimer's, with uh, uh, autism, and she has autism. She's completely off her, uh, off her perception, incorrect, because humans with, with autism have autism, that dysfunction, that neural dysfunction, cognitive dysfunction in a sophisticated brain structure. A dog's brain structure is as sophisticated as it will ever be at this present stage in time. There's no dysfunction that has affected a, a cognitive or functional imbalance or dysfunction. The dog's brain is operating as optimal as they can as evolutionally has developed to this point in time. The child or the human, the adult with autism is physically impaired at the structure of not operating at 100%. They're operating at less than 100% of full now, what normal cognitive abilities, the dog is at 100%. So that's why the comprehension is incorrect. So they're saying the part about dogs seeing each other in the mirror, I mean, sorry, the apes seeing the marks and the colorings and the images and the mirror images and doing the test with the fish and all these kinds of things of seeing other fish and mirror images of fishes, all that kind of stuff. It's all anthropomorphic. It's all very childish in perception because here's the thing. They said dogs fail to recognize themselves in the mirror with the mark on their face. So here, are you ready to destroy what these people have said in the sense of why are you guys saying such silly things? To the dog, do they care if they have a mark on their face? Do they have a structure of ego that is that complicated that the concerns of others is important to them. For a dog to see a mark on the face means that they would be concerned about the mark on the face as their appearance is to the outward world. Your dog doesn't care if they have the mark. Your dog goes through mud. Your dog goes through through brushes, bushes, and everything. They walk through by mirrors walking downtown. They walk by the windows. They look in. They see themselves because they comprehend who they are. But there's no relevance to them. So what? I see myself. I'm not doing anything, and I don't have a complicated sense of psychology where the emotion of egotism comes into play. It's not there. So when I see myself in the mirror, it doesn't mean anything. Who cares? William, William, come here, please. Come, silly boy. Um, 
So, uh, William, come please. So it has no, but see, I'm talking to him in a regular tone of voice. Hi, silly boy. Hello, silly boy. So this is William, uh, formerly uh, quite, a, quite a dangerous dog. Hello, Mr. William. Okay, so so that's that part of it. There, there, there's, William, stop, please. Um, there's that part of it. There's there's no relevance to to the dog about seeing what they look like. Who cares? It has no bearing. Your dog doesn't create a communication channel by the, their parents either. So the, the entire um, sorry, I'm just trying to get this thing out here. Move it because I accidentally closed the screen. So so there's no there's no justification for your dog to look at themselves in the mirror. Right. And we've seen this, and I'm not trying to be in a cruel aspect, but if a person is not attractive and they are, they know they're not attractive, they're not going to look in the mirror because then it becomes self-conscious behavior, psychology, human psychology, bridged in a diluted perspective to animals. So, of course, a human being is like, oh, well, yeah, I, yeah I'm not going to look in the mirror because I'm unattractive. Same thing with a dog in the sense of there's no reason to look for it because the relevance, the context isn't there. I don't see myself. I'm just me. There's no sophistication of ego. It's the structure at that rudimentary format. So they see the mark on themselves. So what? Are they aware of it? 100%. And they could have saved themselves all this time with this silly experiment by simply attaching a piece of paper to the dog's your dog's foot. They'll stop and they'll peel it off because they're aware of it. Because it is relevant to their walking, to the comfort, to their safety. Seeing themselves in the mirror means absolutely nothing. Seeing a mark on their face, absolutely mirror, because there's no sense of ego. But that sense of ego can be developed slightly, but not to the point of optimal evolutional structure at this present time. Um, okay. So that, like I say, the, the, the report, is, is, if you see, it's all structured. It's all sequential. It's all performative. Because the, the academics aren't organically perceiving what is going on. And that is where the death of six million dogs lays in the hands of the academics because they're an un, un uh, they're, they're they're not taking the perceptive from the perspective from the ground up that we, we we've got to figure out what they're doing and what it means in the sense of oh that's what they're doing versus well will they do this let's see if they will let's give them a chance and that becomes the arrogant and conceit aspect and academics uh, are only doing what they have learned from books and silly things like B.F. Skinner. Uh, and and B.F. Skinner was actually debunked by Noam Chomsky. Literally, Noam Chomsky just shredded Skinner and, and, and it was just like, wow, that's so cool to read. And it's in the government archives. Okay, so we'll go to the next one here, two more paragraphs. Although dogs can't identify themselves in the mirror, yes, they can. They can look at themselves in the mirror. There's no emotional relevance. The psychological relevance isn't as complex in a dog to look at themselves in the mirror because they have no, again, no sense of ego. There's no competitive nature, ego, competition, ego driven, right? Those of you who are watching uh, GameStop that's going on with, this, with uh, the stock market, uh, with the Wall Street bets and Reddit and, and the stonks and all that stuff. And uh, um, the, the gentleman who has, uh, was up like $48 million. Th those are things of all competition, of all ego-driven behaviors. I believe the stock is going to go really high. And, and the fact that it jumped up like crazy again this, this week is just coincidental. And the first time it's coincidental for that short squeeze, but it is the point of, for, for Keith Gill uh, and that Reddit guy being up almost $48 million, is the fact that for him, is he knew the fundamentals. He knew what was there. So he figured, I'm going to, to understand the company first. And then I'm going to start betting like big, right? Gamble. But he needed to understand the company before he would invest all that money. He turned $50,000 literally into almost $48 million. And then I think he cashed out $10 million. He still has uh, 100,000 shares. And uh, it's just, you know, and then it went up like $102. So he's got another $10 million basically in value. Uh, but at the same time, anyways, getting back to the part, it's just amazing because it, it, it's, it's a predacious nature that creates these constructs of behavior that find people very successful in whatever they do. And it's coincidental because there's 7 billion people and he's one of them. So all these things. But his motivation and all that stuff was to learn what it was. And then he felt that was important to learn. And then he put it together. Linear, just like the scientists. But then gut feeling is when it took over. He went, okay, you know, I'm going to use my intuition on this as well. 
put the pieces together? What did I feel, etc. <laughs> exactly, it's due to the leash is stuck to the ground. So that's where where it comes down. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, let's just, I should finish. We're almost two hours here. Okay, although dogs can't identify themselves in the mirror, which is there's no reason for them. Like I said, absolutely no reason. There's a trick that you could devise for them to start recognizing who they are. And that simple aspect of structure, kind of like what I said about Anthony with a can of tuna and objectification, which object, object objectification can then be parlayed through consciousness of learning process into a structured protocol of understanding who they are themselves. But that is a much more complicated structure. Like when you say something to your dog and you say, and you have two dogs or more, and you say, oh, so-so, we're so-and-so, right? And they're looking like, oh, yeah. And they they know who they are. When you call their name, they come over to you. Your dog comes over to you. Sense of ego. They know who they are. It's a relevance of what we're asking them in regards to communication, interchange, and physical conduct. Because everything they're doing is natural. Even when they unpredictably attack another each other, it's... Okay. Uh, all right. Um they can recognize their own odor, well, of course, and recall memories of specific events because it's associated with kind of like nostalgia, right? Memory, scent aspect. How many times have you gone into a, a store and you smell something? You're like, oh, my gosh. Like smell baking bread. And you're like, wow, that, I remember when I was a kid, blah, 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 blah. Nostalgia, that recollection, right? And if you see memory, memory is not linear. Memory is organic, dynamic. It's all over compartmentalized everywhere, which is just like the biological compartmentalization of the false positive leading to the construct of uh, consciousness. Um, let's see here. Okay. So they recognize own color and recall memories. Memories of specific events are going to be traumatic aspects, tra uh, experience, uh, experiences where there are heightened levels of emotion where the dog has not learned those type of behaviors or that circumstance before have experienced that environment before and so it creates an impression a memory which is the same thing that we do key of those emotions key, everything working together so so it's a routine aspect problem is most human beings are not consistent because it's so tiring to be consistent with your dog because you have to pay attention to everything they're doing uh they can recognize okay um the, this past evidence led the researchers to suspect Canines show a lower level of self-representation that can only be observed in simpler tests that focus on their body and environment. So what they just said is, dog is too stupid. So now we got to dumb it down even more. What they did wrong, right off the bat, what size is the mat? Blah, blah, blah. You see that? The easiest, easiest thing to figure out in the first place is, well, we got to figure out the mat. What is the structure? Do you want the mat to bend so that causes the dog to fall off? The tidal wave thing that I was uh, suspecting was going to end up happening. Because they're not thinking it through. Because they're only thinking in structured format because they haven't realized that there's a different way to see dogs. And they find this uh, thing with a minky as well. I'll show you guys uh, before I get going. Uh, the, the whole thing is, is so simple. Uh, the, the past, This past evidence led the researchers... Uh, to suspect canines show a lower... Okay, all right, I read that. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the simpler tests that they're going to try to do, and, and those simpler tests are going to be a point where um, they're going to try to have more human engagement uh, in it. So we can see that uh, very likely uh, being that part. And then the simpler test they're going to do is going to be even dumber. So then what ends up happening is then when they take a test that they were dealing with and then they simplify it even more so for, for a new set of dogs to come in, then they themselves will have a predisposed, uh, a pre, uh, you know, they already have a memory of what they themselves. So it's like the dogs recalling memories. They themselves have it. So that's going to taint the perception of what the new set and the new experience are going to happen. Because now they're going to go, well, the last dogs did this. Now the new dogs are doing that. But they don't realize that they made the mistake with the mat and other aspects of their, 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 their structured experiment. So then they're not going to catch that missing piece in the middle, which is, consideration of the mat and how it deals with the dogs by changing different mats and different sizes and different chains or strings to anchor the toy. Those are really simple, but they don't think about it because they're like, well, we can do it. So the dog should be able to do it and we know what to look for. There's where the aspect of dog uh, psychology falls right down the, the, the ground and where I'm very appreciative that Tony is working uh, with me and his company and we'll be working with, um, some of the university academics who are receptive to what I've been uh, sharing.
So the last paragraph, for a dog being aware of how big is the body or how the body can be an obstacle, it's reasonable to expect this is, okay, it's reasonable to expect. Okay, so for a dog to know who and how big they are, it's reasonable to expect. So now they're saying, yeah, okay, so the dog is aware of themselves. This isn't so that so you saw the leading in the first article, right? You know, classic writing, right? Journalism. So, you know, bring it in, close it up, right? Finish the loop. Compliance. Bring me a glass of water. Thank you. Stop pulling on the leash. Thank you. Same thing right there. So it's like articling that journal. You see the human behavior in the overt, the gross appearance of it? Subtle marketing aspects, advertising, etc. Promotion, human manipulation of our psychology. The same part with dogs finish the loop she's finishing the loop now by closing off the sentence to tighten everything up so that way we don't perceive loose ends for the smart viewer my smart followers you guys have seen like she's gone she's she's just like whatever and then if we read the articles which are more lineal you're going to see more of the aspect like oh well this is really boring and and, and silly because we already know the outcome it's going to fail because of the article but it's going to fail because of exactly why and so having the Smithsonian put out an article like this is kind of silly because, um, yeah, uh, for a dog, uh, but then they got to put out articles anyway. So, I mean, it's a publication for a dog being aware of how, bo how, how big is the body, how big their body is. So she, she didn't want to say the dog it, it, and she didn't want to give a pronouning or individualization to the dog. So they said, she said, how big is the body instead of how big is their body? And she didn't want to say how big is its body. She wanted to anthropomorphize it and, and, and create an objectification of the dog. Materialism. Again, it's a human perception by the journalists themselves. Not her fault, just the way humans perceive things. Okay, or okay, for a dog being aware of how big is the body or how the body can be an obstacle, it's reasonable to expect this is an animal with a complex nervous system. So she's writing this stuff from what she's read in those science articles that she's uh, compiled, right? Converged, conflated, whatever. And she's seeing the same refrain every time being spoken, that the dog is a very intelligent animal, fast-moving animal. But the context, the scale is not being comprehended. And that's why my trolls are like, he doesn't know what he's talking about, because they they're literally not smart enough to see what's going on. And it's not a hoo-ha, this is at the end of the thing. It's the fact that they're not fast enough. They're not processing quick enough to comprehend what's going on. So things like that, when they write that way, says we're still stepping away because nobody knows what to do. We still don't know what we're doing. But the dog is definitely, the animal is definitely smart. We just haven't figured it out yet. Because, again, you're coming from the top. You came from the bottom, looked up with respect. You'd be able to understand how is he going to figure out the map, how does the dog perceive this and that, et cetera. And then adjustments and the, and the tests are just... Dumb, because they're using tests that work with elephants. Now they, oh well, dog. the psychology is not being understood in the scale between the elephants and dogs, and that's their error as well. Um, okay, this is an animal with a complex nervous system. It's an intelligent animal. It's a fast-moving animal. If you think about how dogs eat, you can imagine that a dog often has to hold down a bigger chunk of food, let's say, and use its own body as a counterweight to be able to take off the meat from a bone or whatever. So this is an appropriate context to test the cognitive capacity. So basically what she's saying is, is we, she's giving the assumption that the dog is smart enough to tear meat away from something so that when the dog understands that it's con that the, the toy is connected to a line that he just sees the ends again, like a leash and he pulls and he can't pull on it and all that stuff, right? He can't pull it off. So that would make sense for the dog to start leveraging themselves around to get at the, at the meat. And that's wrong. She's wrong. And the scientists are wrong. Your dog can taste a toy versus meat. His behavior is going to change differently. We know dogs are motivated for highly valuable food and treats and snacks. They'll do more for this than they will for that. It's a toy. It's a conscious difference of control and, and, and cognizance of the product itself, that stuffed animal, versus that being of food. So now here we go even further wrong down the, the rabbit hole is the fact that now they think that this is what's happening. Oh, on the mat, the pull it off. That's why the dog did it. Conjecture. That's completely a failure. Hi, silly boy, William. Hi, silly boy. So with the boy, like whenever I touch my dogs, I just keep my hand perfectly still. 
I tell people, keep your hand perfectly still because your dog is hyper uh, hyper uh, aware of their body. Like I said, your dog's sleeping. You can just touch them. They'll wake right away, especially a skittish dog. They'll turn and attack. See the hack a little bit? Well, you can't see the hack a little bit back there. Um, these, these are, let me just uh, fix my here. Yeah, the William. So William's a small, a small Dane. He's like, I think, 105, 110 pounds. So he's pretty, he's relatively small, right? Um, his issues is the same thing like uh, with a uh, uh, beef cat still there. His issues were like when I would come home, especially when I first got him, he would jump up at me. And then not only would he jump at me, he would start biting me with hard bites. And this is during the winter time, so it's great. I have my jacket on, so he would do that. And that's anxiety-driven issue. So by taking care of him and letting him know, see how he flinched just now when I touched the top of his neck there? So that indicates, again, that flinch response. Some dogs flinch once. Some dogs flinch twice. Those flinch responses are in regards to how the dog is processing their environment consciously. Because then the dog can be taught not to flinch again by how we touch them, by safety. By that aspect. And other times when I'm not touching him and, and, and not doing anything like that, and I go to touch him. So if I keep a distraction, keeping right, William wants to touch with my one hand, he let me slow it down a bit. And William wants to touch, wants to be petted, affection. And then when I touch him on the top, that flinch response, you saw the flinch response is slightly muted in this sense. And it's almost that that kind of like control. And then we touch him again. You see that there's still a little bit of a slight uh, flinch response. I can feel that as well, right? That's why I keep my hand still. There's that harder flinch response. So that way I can feel how the dog's behavior is doing. That's why I give them hugs and keep them safe. But it's a psychological process also allows the dogs to understand that you will protect them. It allows you to feel the way their breathing patterns, the physicality, whether or not they're trying to get away, whether or not they're scared, worried, et cetera. It allows your dog to feel whether or not you are calm. If you're in a difficult environment and the person next to you is scared as well, you're going to go, whoa, why are you scared? You're scared too? That's concerned. You're okay, William. So if something happens, scares William, I'll immediately uh, reconnect with him. And the way I just said that to him, see, the tone again is different versus what I'm saying to him. Okay? And this is the, uh, William, oh, please. Sammy might kill you. Sam. <laughs> so there's Sammy, right? And then there's one, William, you're okay. So then I walk William back a bit. And when I walk William back a bit by himself, I follow him with my hand, but I don't leave my body position then it's more physicality that he's, he has to contend with. If I start getting up, he's like, well, what's going on? This part, I maintain a structure, a foundation that he understands I can rely on at all times of how my human, my dad, moves around. Then the behavior becomes predictable. Then he doesn't become so concerned because he goes, okay, this is what he normally does anyways. See, a little bit of a flinch response there as well. So we work on these things. We're always constantly working on what's going on, watching his tail behavior, all those other aspects. There's Sammy, who is, um, there's, there's a Sam. William, so you see the aspect of codependency behavior, right? How he paws, that's a controlled behavior. And the reason why it seems so erratic is because of the fine motor skills are not there. Can they be refined a bit? Yes, but they will never be exact, obviously. But it's a codependent behavior that occurs from your dogs needing you. Right, it, it, we're going to we'll talk about it a little bit later at another live. It's a codependent behavior why they do that, and they've learned that from a number of things, especially dogs that have never been treat trained to give a paw. They see that behavior by us, by us physically handling things, by us holding hands with somebody else or giving hugs or or, or moving dishes. That aspect, then they understand that causation, which again destructs, deconstructs, or should I say, disrupts what this article says about self awareness. This is self awareness. If I stop, William will, hi, silly boy. William will ask for it more. Sense of ego. What am I doing? I'm petting him. See the flinch response? The self-conscious awareness. So then what happens? Self-aware. Conscious behavior. Conduct. If he stops petting me, I'm going to ask for more pets because it feels good how the dogs process pain through a redundant and rhetorical format. That's what ends up happening. I want to feel affection. I'm going to ask for it. Conscious behavior. The article is immature. It's incorrect. It's insufficient. And it's 100% fallible. That's why when I'm working with extremely dangerous dogs, I read stuff like this. And it's just like, we've got to change the way academia perceives the world for dogs. It's over 
over 100 million dogs domesticated, not stray dogs, but domesticated dogs in North America. There are over 1 billion stray dogs. Now, not to just mention only, you know, horses being sent to Japan for sushi meat and, and other aspects that are happening. Um, we as a society need to change what we do and we can do that. You see the perception of going on with what's happening with William is understanding cognizance. He's aware. Okay, William, stop, please. Okay, um, let me just see. William, I'm gonna get William up here. Okay. I, we, and I was up early doing the laundry. William, up, please. Okay, Sammy, I'm gonna get Sammy off so she doesn't. I know, Sammy, you look so comfy, but let me take you off for a bit. And then David is here. So what David may do, there may be a little bit of a conflict with David. So there might be a bit. William, come, please. And then I'll get Sammy up on here. Up, please. And then Minky's coming up here now. So here's William. Okay, so William's concerns, because right beside him is, and I'm going to close off this silly article. Okay, so the article is off. So with, with William, and then there's David. So William's 100, like I say, 100, 510 pounds. David behind me here is almost 200 pounds in his behavior. Let me move this huge microphone out of the way. So, and David is close to 200 pounds. And I'll show you that video, actually. I'll show you the video of um, Minky first before I forget that. And then, um, let me just see here. Okay, so uh, hopefully you guys can see this, but I'm just going to show you the video of, of Minky. He sees the food bowls out for them. He is ready to eat as a ravenous Minky dog is going to be. Hi, Minky. Oh, he's looking at himself. Did you guys see that? He actually looked at himself, recognized himself from the mirror because he's seen himself in the mirror. And I actually have a video of Minky. So that is right then in their irrefutable proof. Dogs recognize themselves and are self-aware. Limitation. It's limitations uh, structured by the socialization, the level of socialization, the, uh, the, the extravagance of socialization, the context on how we control and let the dog understand their sense of self. So that article is wrong. The article is completely a waste of taxpayers' money, to be honest with you, and donors' money. The, the, the research from those three different universities or the three different sections is a waste of money. Mickey knows who he is. There's David as well. Hi, silly boy. So all these aspects that happen with dogs is is a sense of understanding. But we're uh, scientists. We are looking at it the wrong way. We're looking at it the way of expectation versus a way of determination. I should have been a spoken word poet. William, hi, silly boy. Okay, so we don't have any conflict going off today. There's nothing. Hi, silly boy. Hi, William. See, you see how oh, there's another thing too as well, how the dog swallows, right? When he swallows, when you get really kind of like make him feel good or they kind of, something's odd and you kind of, and they start like, right? that's physiological aspects of an emotional expression that the dog is unable to process in a sense of cognitive experience. So it's a bit heightened for them. So then they manifest it that way. So when you see these behaviors manifesting in dogs, especially dangerous dogs, skittish dogs, dysfunctional dogs, even just classical training aspects, all these things apply so that way you can start to follow and, and identify what is going on with the dog. Okay, so I'm going to end this off. Judy, I'm sorry. I, I can't um, answer all the questions. Uh, I've been here like uh, two hours 10 and the, and the pups have to go outside and hang out a bit. I give them a snack. If you have any questions, please uh, you know, feel free to comment and, and I'm going to go live. I'm not sure when. And if you want to send me articles and, and uh, if I see something that is of interest, that's when I'm going to do my next live is to, to kind of you know correct incorrect academic articles or just anecdotal articles like why did your dog follow you into the bathroom those kinds of things correct all that misinformation that's out there and that's why i say that there's uh, a very simple manner to down train and stabilize your dog even if you have a normal kind of dog the psychology that i'm talking about allows you to realize oh my gosh that's what they're doing i thought so but i wasn't sure well here i've worked with them all obviously you know uh, that's why I say that part about the, the, the trainer that specializes only in pit, pit bull training. 
It's different. You saw Sammy. Is it there? Is it Minky. Hi, Minky. So I'm trying to get Minky to come in. He probably won't come in. Yeah. Um, so it just comes to the point of just understanding structure of your dog's behavior. So that way, even on a normal dog, you can look, oh, look, that's what they're doing. That's why their eyebrow went, the right eyebrow went up or the left eyebrow went up. Why the tail behavior. If you watch your dog's tail, right, it's violent. Sometimes it's soft. Sometimes it's halfway on one way. It's the other way. Sometimes it's figure eight. Those are all aspects of the dog's ego. And I talked to Tony about that, right? Him and I were doing that project in regards to artificial intelligence uh, into the sentient process, um, you know, right? Like I say, he's 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 sold proprietary software to Microsoft. What it comes down to the point is watching the tail behavior because it is reflective of behavior. Just like somebody else has nuances or ticks or whatever. Same thing with a dog. It's physiologically present. So there's there's Mr. David. Hi, David. Hi, silly boy. Yes, he is that big. Those are two Costco foamy doggy beds. David, hi, silly boy. There's been a lot of confrontations between him and I in the sense that he has become quite uh, at sometimes because I start pushing out onto other aspects of his psychology. And there, so as those layers come out, right, just like anybody coming through a, a difficult process or you fall in love with somebody who heals all your broken pieces and then you expose more of yourself to them. Same thing when it comes to David as he becomes psychologically more stable, more aspects of, of his submerged dysfunctions, behaviors, trauma, beatings, and all that kind of abuse that he has historically suffered from start to bubble up just like a human being. Then we address those things because then the behavior becomes more complex and it's in simplicity of expression in the sense of it's more over like, but the sense is that, okay, now why is that happening? Then we go back, okay, we've addressed issues of dysfunctions, abandonment, beatings, uh, uh, communication, etc., cetera, uh, timing, rhythm issues, intonation, all that stuff. So this means that a different part of the psychology is coming out, which is more deep seated, more predatorial driven behavior. So then we have that, that happens there. So David, Hello, Mr. William. Then you see, oh, and you, you just probably just miss William yawning. And in my post on Facebook, I talk about the fact that yawning is a cognitive dissipation of behavior of an emotional process that your dog is unable to create a summation, a conclusion of. He is not able to process the emotionality of what has happened. So, so then it goes through. Same thing when a dog is sneezing frequently, that aspect. It's an emotional process as well. What ends up happening is they sneeze to kind of not to dissipate things in their nose. Physiologically, they feel it. Physically, they feel the emotional process. They don't have a way to to exhaust it through uh, behavior other than that. It's not some of the same as humans yawning because people are like, oh, we don't know why humans yawn. Well, it's all related. It's all that aspect of, of right? Because how many times have you been sitting in your in your living room and you went and you yawn like, right? You're like, oh, I wonder why I was yawning. I'm not tired. Right, it, it, it's it's a dissipation aspect for a dog specifically. For a human being, it's going to be in a much more dilute circumstance because we're more sophisticated in our, our construct. Hi, silly boy. So I always leave the hands still, all that kind of stuff. And then William's asking again, sense of ego. All right, guys, uh, thank you so much. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. All that kind of stuff. If you have any topics you want me to talk about uh, next time, uh, I'll obviously, you know, feel free to ask. And then we'll we'll figure it out. Hi, Mr. David. David is so funny because he, here, everything's packed away. Got all my stuff out here and trying to get it all good. Mr. David. William. See, William's a small one, and look how big his head is. So that's the. All right, guys. Um, have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Be safe. Thank you so much. And uh, please make sure to hit the subscribe button if you're uh, wanting to see more of this um, stuff. And then uh, hopefully as announcements go with Tony uh, and as things move forward in the academic aspects of things uh, and my work is, you know, uh, move towards being peer reviewed and all that stuff, then we'll be able to see a bit more change in the dog training industry. So that's what my announcement was for 2021. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to change the lives and save the lives of literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dogs through these simple aspects of dressing behavior and the silly academic tests that they're doing that are already doomed to fail without even trying because of the comprehension of dogs. All right, guys, take it easy. Let's go. Have fun. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. There you go. All right, guys. Bye-bye.